Chapter seven. Chapter seven. Murder music. 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 Vision the canvas. I paint a picture similar to Ernie Barnes, nigga. But mine's is more ghetto, more guns, more drugs, mostly thugs. All of my thugs, they baby mom, daughters and sons. Streets raised me. In early 1998, Havoc and I decided to open a new album budget with Loud Records so we can get a new check. Loud agreed that it was time for it, so they gave us six figures and we started working on our fourth album. I came up with the title Murder Music because the songs we've been making sounded so sinister like murder music. I told Havoc that we should buy a house and live together as a team. Godfather, twin, Gotti, Nitty, Havoc, and myself, so we can constantly bang out songs. We found a perfect brand new five bedroom mini mansion in Freeport, Long Island. Built a studio in the basement, and we all moved in. Kiki and Shaka, too. That tan house with forest green shutters, a front porch, a small backyard, was the first piece of property that Havoc and I ever owned. I put the entire house together myself. The gray carpet, wooden blinds, furniture, TVs for every room. Havoc let a couple of extras move in. Papa Mob, a.k.a. MCT, from Queensbridge. He was pushing 50-something. And Tom Nitty's cousin, Bolo. I knew it was a bad idea, but Havoc wanted them in, so I agreed. I even let Havoc take the biggest room in the house, so he could feel good about being home. Determined to live a peaceful, positive life and make smart business decisions, I tried my best to get all my boys to do the same. But we were a bunch of savages, and I was the only one ready for a change. I posted house rules on the refrigerator and gave everybody a job to do. From the beginning, I could tell that Bolo was lazy. He didn't rap or produce, it was just a deadbeat. Once a week, I called house meetings in the living room. Get a hotel if you were the girl, because I don't want nobody to know where we live, I told him. Or blindfold your girls before you get off the highway exit so the bros don't know where they're going. I had Kiki and Shaka with me, and I wanted to make sure my family was safe. Within six months, the guys were breaking every rule. Havoc was the main one breaking them and the others followed them. It felt like they were talking behind my back. P's crazy with all these house rules. We're partying in this bitch as soon as he's not looking. And they were. Kiki was disgusted by the way my friends were living and the number of girls that she saw coming and going. She found a list of symptoms of HIV, AIDS, and taped it to the refrigerator next to the house rules. The next day, the paper was gone. I guess it made somebody feel insecure about their health. Godfather, his boy Tomax, and I were heading home from Soundtrack Studios at 3 o'clock in the morning. Just as Left Rack was coming up on our left on the Long Island Expressway, a giant bright green fireball about the size of a falling planet shot down from the sky. I almost crashed the car. Oh, shit! I yelled. Did you see that? See what? Golf over asked from the passenger seat. Son, you ain't just see that big green fire just now. No. I just closed my eyes to go to sleep, he said. Tom Max, you ain't see that? I asked. Nah, I just closed my eyes too. I couldn't believe it. We were all wide awake and having a conversation just seconds before. The clock on the dashboard read 3.33 a.m. I had been studying books on numerology, and to see something that extraordinary at that exact time was obviously a sign, and a sign meant only for me. In Dr. York's books, he said that God's angels, the Elohim, use green fire, and the evil forces use amber or red fire. My pops and I used to watch shooting stars and comets at certain times of the year. But there was no comparison to what I had just seen. 
Pops and grandmas told me that when Pops was young, they saw a multicolored UFO in Virginia hovering above a store for several minutes and then take off with light speed. At the crib in Freeport, nobody believed what I had seen except for Godfather, Twin, and Gotti. I had been praying and asking the Creator to show me a sign or some type of proof that all the things I was learning about the origin of life on Earth were in fact true. I was grateful to receive a sign, but furious with the Most High for not giving me a witness. Maybe I'm bugging, I thought. They had me doubt with my own eyes. The brand new mini mansion in Freeport was slowly but surely becoming disgusting. Carpet stains, sticky shit on the hardwood floor, garbage overflowed, and dishes piled up in the sink. Kiki was seven months pregnant and fed up. Bolo was lying on my $8,000 gray suede couch with his stinking feet up when I came home one afternoon. Yo, this nigga Bolo is a bummy, dirty-ass motherfucker. I told Bolo to clean up or get out, calling him Benson and Mr. Belvedere so he'd get mad and want to fight. He laughed it off and started cleaning. Havoc and Noy were at Platinum Island Studio, working on murder music. I robbed a few hours into the session, and Havoc had this ill beat playing while Noy was writing a verse. I rolled the blunt, kicking rhymes in my head. I put my lifetime in between the paper's lines. I'm the quiet storm nigga who fights rhyme. Hav left with Noy to meet some girls. What? I couldn't believe that they'd rather meet girls they make a new song to this incredible beat. It was one of the best beats I ever heard. I smoked my blunt and started writing one of the best rhymes ever. Are you the same too? Going through the emotions, a gun holding, long shotguns down my pants, leg limping, killer B, you still living, even my pops too, he taught me how to shoot when I was seven. I used to bust shots crazy, I couldn't even look cause the loud sound used to scare me. I love my pops for that. Love my nigga, he black. Take the life of anybody trying to change what's left. I spent too many nights sniffing coke, getting right, wasting my life. Now I'm trying to make things right. Nigga, please, don't make me have to risk my freedom. We worked our whole life for this. I finished the song in three hours and named it White Lines for the time being because the sample was from the old Melly Mel song of the same name. When I played it the next day, Everyone liked it, but they didn't understand the power that that song had. I immediately gave it to DJ Clue, who started playing it a lot. Meanwhile, I got a new budget for my solo album, H&IC, and rumors flew that Mob Deep was breaking up because Prodigy was going solo. You guys are breaking up? Radio interviewers and random fans on the street would ask. You're going solo? It wasn't true. I had a hustler's mentality, and doing a solo album only meant more money in my bank. I wrote so many songs, I couldn't let them all pile up and collect dust. Plus, the fans always said I was the best rapper in Mob Deep. I never felt I was better. Havoc used to write my rhymes, and he spit some of the best verses I ever heard. But that's what everybody else told me. Even have it. So it was inevitable. See, I told you that you was better than Nas, Twin said. Do you think you better than Nas now? He'd always ask. No. But when I was sitting writing verses, in my head I was thinking, shit, I'm the best rapper that ever lived. Stobo, Twin Gambino, and I linked with the rapper Big Pun at his crib in the Bronx one night to head to a club called Carbon on 56th Street and 11th Avenue in Manhattan. The same spot where the Scarface twin once carved QB in the kid's face with a razor. Pun, or Big Punisher as some called him, was our new label mate at Loud Records. We got real cool after collaborating on the songs Tres Leches. In the kitchen, at Pun's house, Pun was sitting in front of the refrigerator 
with the fridge and freezer doors open and a table fan inside blowing the cold air on them. True ghetto air conditioning. Please, pun. You gotta stop doing all this gangster shit. Fat Joe was begging and pleading with pun. You're a celebrity now. You can't keep beating and trying to kill people. You gotta chill with all that. Listen, I'm not trying to hear nothing you're saying right now, Pun said. First off, I wasn't trying to kill him. And second off, P is here, so shut the fuck up. Yo, P, what's up, man? Pun, I saw you with the knife in your hand about to stab the guy, Joe said. A big knife with spiked brass knuckles attached to it was lying on the couch in the living room. Pun walked into the living room with Twin Gambino and I were checking out his knife. That ain't shit, Pun said turning to one of his 15 friends hanging out in the house. Show P your gun. The kid reached down to his ankle and pulled out a federal issue mini 45 caliber, all black, plastic, about three, four inches long. Then Pun looked at another one of his friends. Show P your gun. One by one, all the dudes said, look at this one, look at my gun. Check this one out, P. Until 13 guns are out. Pun looked at me and said, Show us your gun, P. My gun is in the car. I said, feeling dumb. Don't ever do that again, Pun said, disappointed. If we were foul, we could have a drop on you right now. Pun's debut album, Capital Punishment, went platinum that year. And sadly, when he was recording his follow-up, Yeah Baby, he died from a heart attack and complication from being overweight. I really miss that dude. R.I.P., big homie. Ray Benzino from the rap group RSO, and who was the co-owner of the Source magazine at that time, had a production company called Hangman 3 that made good beats. He invited me to his mansion in Boston where he had a studio so we could work on music for my solo album. My fake cousin Stobo came with me. We met Benzino and his source partner, Dave Mays, at JFK Airport and caught a quick flight to Boston. Toward the end of the flight, the captain made an announcement. Now, this is your captain speaking. We seem to have a problem with the landing gear. We're going to have to circle around for a while and see if we can get it working and so we can land. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Ten minutes later, the captain got back on the loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to announce that we're going to have to make an emergency landing without the landing gear. We have fire trucks and ambulances waiting on the ground for us. Please do not panic. An East Indian guy sitting in front of Stobo and me pulled out his credit card and used the airplane phone and the headrest to call his wife. Baby, my plane is about to crash. I love you, he said. I, I probably won't ever see you again. It was Stobo's first time on a plane. He closed his eyes. We were both scared to death. Just as the plane was nearing the runway, the wheels dropped down and we landed safely. The driveway outside Benzino's mansion was lined with Ferraris, Bentleys, and Lamborghinis. Stobo and I stayed for two days and found two beats. One I never used, and the other one became What You Rep, featuring Nori. Nori had just dropped his self-titled solo album, and a new rapper from Harlem, Cameron, was starting to make some noise with another rapper from Harlem, Mace, who was already on fire and signed to Puffy. Dave and Benzino put together a Source magazine tour with Nori and Cameron as the headliners. I hadn't spoken to Nori since he shot Johnny in the leg by mistake, and our crew jumped him in front of Club Crystals in Jamaica, Queens, and he got my man Ty Nitty shot in the back. So it was weird to reach out to him and put him on my album. But he was hot at that time, and it was a good business move. He came and did the song with no problem, and we deaded the tension. The Source Tour started soon after Nori and I recorded the track. Money No, my cousin JM, Stobo, and I 
drove to the Philly Greek Festival, and ran into Dave Mays, Benzino, Nori, Cameron, and Big Daddy Kane at the park where they were performing. Dave, Benzino, and Nori suggested that we follow them for the rest of the tour and hop on stage to do a song or two. So we followed them from Philly to Washington, D.C., Delaware, Maryland, and Asbury Park, New Jersey, where DMX made a surprise appearance on stage with a bunch of pit bulls performing Get At Me, Dog. While I was working on HNIC, I started eating healthy food, put myself on a strict diet and lifestyle. I cut out red meat, pork, fried foods, white bread, it's bleach white, white rice, it's bleach white, mono and diglycerides, animal fat, artificial coloring, juice, animal milk for baby animals, not humans, alcohol, soda, only ginger ale occasionally, canned foods, aluminum causes Alzheimer's disease, artificial sweetness, candy, fluoride, fluoride is poison, weed, and cigarettes. My new diet consisted of fish, chicken, turkey, which is broiled, baked, or grilled, brown rice, yams, potatoes, green vegetables, bottled water all night and day, margarine instead of butter, soy milk instead of animal milk, wheat bread without mono and diglycerides, pure cane brown sugar, vegetarian chili, the frozen kind, original oatmeal, honey nut shredded wheat, post raisin bran, turkey sausage, fruit, fruit contains acid that kills germs, so you're only supposed to eat it when you have a cold. If you eat it every day, the acid will no longer have the same effect. Nuts for protein, protein shakes, multivitamins and minerals. That's my word to everything I love. After a year of following that plan, I stopped getting sickle cell attacks, and I felt the best I ever felt in my life. When you clean out your body and mind, that's when you start receiving your blessings from the universe. I was now 100% clean and sober. After the source tour, I bumped into Shamik's boy, E. Money Bags, at a barbecue in Queensbridge. He gave me a videotape of some guy in church speaking about spirituality and health. He broke it down like this. There's a positive energy all around that we can't see. Here to help guide us through life. But when we have bad food, alcohol, drugs, smoke, and negative thoughts in us, it's like a thick cloud of black smoke inside and around our body blocking us from receiving or giving that positive energy at its maximum potential. That energy is alive and real, even though we can't see it. Doctors and teachers won't tell you this because the world is set up to keep us down. It's against the law for a medical doctor to prescribe natural or holistic remedies for diseases. If caught, they may lose their license or spend time in prison. Some doctors don't believe in the alternative way of living and thinking. Others aren't in tune with it. Others blatantly keep the information secret because medicine is big business, and if everyone were healthy, then hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and mainstream doctors would damn near go out of business. I felt like a machine. My brain was moving a million miles per hour. I pitched Steve Rifkin the idea for my murder music movie. Master P's movie, Bout It, Bout It, pushed me to write my own script and Steve encouraged us to do our own thing. I convinced him to give me a budget for the soundtrack. I got 650000 for it. Yes, 650000 Plus, 450000 for my solo album, HNIC, and 200000 for my cut of the Mob Deep's Murder Music album. I never had so much money in my life. That summer... I bought a black buggy eye Benz with charcoal seats and a stash box for my guns, along with a burgundy J30 Infinity with white seats for Kiki. She was real happy when she saw that car. She finally had her own shit. Raekwon had his birthday party at some bar on Staten Island, 
and Mob Deep went to celebrate with him and all of Wu-Tang. It was a cool get-together, and we left fairly early. Havoc, Noid, and everybody got home 20 minutes before me. They were in the kitchen laughing and talking, still drunk from the party, when I got in the house. Tired, I went upstairs and got in the bed with Kiki and Shaka. As I was dozing off, Noid and Bolo started screaming, and I heard them mention my name. Call P downstairs and let him know you don't like it when he call you Benson, Noid told Bolo. What? I put my clothes back on and went downstairs. Bolo says he's not feeling all that Benson and Mr. Belvedere shit, Noy said. I told you, if you don't want to clean up every day, you're going to have to get out, I told Bolo. If Havoc don't tell me to do it, then I don't have to do it, dirty ass Bolo said. I'm not here with you, I'm here with Havoc. If Hav says I can stay, then I can stay. I punched him in his mouth. Gotti grabbed Bolo, holding him from fighting back. I was screaming at Bolo, calling him pussy, Benson, Mr. Belvedere, asshole, taunting him to break free from Gotti. I even tried to get Gotti mad so he would let go. Don't let little ass Gotti hold you, I yelled. Bolo's a big dude. Look how little he is. Gotti finally let Bolo go but he acted like he didn't want to fight because I was smaller than him. So I punched him in his mouth again. Get out of my house. No, I'm here with Havoc, Bolo said, his face dripping blood. I'm here with Hav. Why am I fighting and screaming, I thought to myself. I should just go upstairs, get my gun, and shoot him in the leg. Upstairs, Kiki stopped me from getting the gun and calmed me down. I banged on Havoc's door and told Havoc what happened. He told me to give Bolo another chance. Havoc's got these slouch fools destroying our house and he just lets it go down? Man, fuck another chance. If you don't kick Bolo out, then I'm gonna leave, I said. I'm not kicking him out, Hav said. You're overreacting. I'm dead serious. If you don't kick Bolo out, I'm going to leave. I'm not coming back. Have decided to let Bolo stay. So I left the next morning. I couldn't let it get to the point where Havoc and I were beefing. Because then both our monies would stop flowing. Bolo was lucky I ain't shoot him in his leg. Kiki, Shaka, and I moved temporarily into a duplex apartment in Bushwick, Brooklyn. In a brand new building on Linden Street in Knickerbocker. The rent was only $500 a month. The only downside was that we were back in the hood. But as long as I was far, far away from the idiots we'd been living with, that was all I cared about. I went to the Long Island house to visit and record, but that was it. Early one morning at the Freeport house, a guy named Larry knocked on the door, and Gotti answered. Larry was an independent film director and producer looking for Marv Deep to make a cameo in his first flick, Statistic, with Redman, the Lost Boys, and an old school rapper named Dana Dane. I had just completed my first script for Murder Music, the movie, and was looking for somebody with the equipment and the knowledge to shoot it. I told Larry that if he helped me shoot my movie, I would make a cameo in his. No problem, he said. A month later, we put a budget together for murder music. My intentions were to spend no more than $60,000. But I wanted real gunfire, mansions, helicopters, police cars, a jail, and more. So the initial budget ended up being $120,000. Larry and I made a verbal agreement that he would get 5% of the profit and a co-director's credit. We started filming immediately and finished half of the movie in a few months. I wrote the script so that Noid, Godfather, Prince Guard, Twin, Hav's Uncle Lamik, and an OG from Queensbridge named Tim Lord, who's Nas's right-hand man, were the stars, while Havoc, Nas, and I had small roles. 
Noy, Godfather, Twin, Hav, and I sat up all night rehearsing the lines at the crib in Freeport. The housing authority wouldn't allow us to shoot guns in Queensbridge, so the gun shooting scenes had to be filmed in Red Hook projects in Brooklyn. Noy's whole family is from Red Hook, so some of them were in the movie as well. My number one mistake was that I should have had Larry ink the deal first. Larry seemed cool and down to earth, so I didn't rush the contract. That was the last time I made that mistake. Havoc and I got a call that month from Charlene Thomas, who worked in the production management department at Loud Records. Mary J. Blodge had contacted Charlene, requesting that Mob Deep be featured on one of her new songs, called Deep Inside. At the recording session in Manhattan, Mary was sitting in a lounge chair with her legs hanging over the armrest, lighting a slender cigar, wearing big sunglasses. She looked good, like a female pimp. She hopped out of the chair and greeted us with hugs and kisses. The beat sounded hot, so I grabbed a seat, a pen and a pad, and Mary told the engineer to play the song so we could hear her lyrics. I finished my verse in about 20 minutes. Havoc laid his next, and we were done real fast. A month or two later, Charlene from Lau called again. What's up? Today's Mary J's birthday, and she wants to take you guys to dinner with her, Charlene said. Just you and Havoc. She's sending a car to pick you up around 6 p.m., okay? Hell yeah, it was okay. I got fresh, met up with Hav, and we hopped in the S550 Benz that she sent. We stopped to buy Mary some birthday flowers before the car dropped us off in front of an exclusive Chinese restaurant in Midtown Manhattan. We figured it would be a dinner party with a bunch of her friends and family, but when we walked inside the spot, we saw Mary and one of her girlfriends seated at a table for four. We gave Mary her flowers, said happy birthday, and sat down. Where's everybody at? I asked. It's just us, Mary said. I wanted to take y'all out to eat and thank you guys for working with me. You know Mob Deep is my favorite rap group. Havoc sat next to Mary's friend, a good-looking, light-skinned female, and I sat next to Mary. Mary asked me what kind of drinks I liked. I told her I was drinking whatever she was drinking. You ever had a Cosmo? She asked. A what? A Cosmo, she repeated. It's more of a lady's drink, but it's good. Try one with me. All right, cool, I said. Mary ordered a round of Cosmos, pink and chill in large martini glasses. Mary ordered another round. The first one gave me a crazy buzz because I hadn't been drinking. But how could I refuse drinks with Mary J. Blas on her birthday? I ain't drinking no more after the night. I promised myself. This is a special occasion. The next round of Cosmos came out with our main course. Mary was filling the drinks and started getting comfortable, asking me questions. How old are you, Pete? 24. What's your sign? Scorpio, November 2nd. You got a lady? She asked. You married? Mary was flirting with me, giving me all kinds of signs. But I didn't realize it until I looked in her eyes and saw how dead serious she was. I got real shy and nervous, stuck like a deer in headlights. Man, this was Mary J. Blood. My mouth wanted to say no but my brain forced my mouth to give an honest answer. Yeah, I said. How long have you been with her? She asked. For about five years now. That's good. That's what I'm looking for in my life, Mary said. I need somebody to be serious with. Mary was cool as hell, beautiful and very down to earth. I felt like a fool for not pursuing her, but I was really in love with my woman. Havoc hooked up with Mary's girlfriend that night, and I went home to Kiki. Our manager, Chris Lighty, became more popular than ever with his companies, Violator Management and Violator Records. When other rappers found out that Chris was our manager, they wanted Chris to manage them too. His roster was growing, 
and in order to handle that, he was going to need some help. Chris's brothers were also in the music industry. His older brother, Dave Lighty, worked at Jive Records. His younger brother, Mike Lighty, had a booking agency, and his youngest brother, Jonathan, started helping us book studio sessions and contacted outside producers and guest features for Murder Music. One night, Jonathan, Havoc, Gotti, Noid, and I were in the studio tossing around ideas about who should be featured on the album. Jonathan came up with the idea of getting somebody from the South so that we could bridge the gap, and Havoc suggested that we get 8-Ball from the Memphis rap group 8-Ball and MJG. Chris hooked it up and we flew to Houston, Texas to Swisher House Studios. Eight Ball was standing at a table cutting up weed with a pair of scissors next to Bun B from UGK. Man, y'all niggas don't even know. Me and my niggas love Mob Deep, Bun B said. Y'all got them burnt biscuits, nigga. That's that ice pick shit. Eight Ball rolled up some of his weed in the Swisher Suite. As thick clouds of strong smoke filled the studio, we listened to some Swisher House beats and found one that we all liked and knocked out the song, Where You From, featuring 8-Ball in about two hours. Afterwards, we went to the hotel to get some rest for the morning flight back to New York. Back home, I started coming up with more and more ideas for my solo career. Since Havoc and I weren't seeing eye to eye with something as serious as our house, I had to plan for my and my kids' future. I'm always mobbed deep to the death. But I decided to invest all my time and energy into my solo album, shoot my movie, and start a clothing company because the future was looking unpredictable. I needed to have my own career going in case things didn't work out between us. Before Sean John, Rockaway, and all the other rapper-branded clothing existed, my inspiration came from Wu-Tang's Wu Wear and Russell Simmons' Fat Farm. Watching how RZA and his crew raped the corporate world, I admired Wu-Tang's business savvy. They made over $11 million from Wu Wear within a couple of years, so I quickly came up with a concept for a brand called Infamous. I had Infamous t-shirts printed and wore them in photo shoots so Loud's art department would add the photos inside Murder Music to start promoting the brand. One of the art dudes at Loud had friends in the fashion industry who put together a four-season lookbook, like a demo for the clothing line to present to possible buyers and backers, and had a few samples made. I met with several investors and backers, but none of them saw my vision. Fuck it. If you want something done right, you know the rest. My man DJ Hot Day from Queensbridge had a record store on 147th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue right near where Havoc and I used to live. I had connections in that hood, so instead of waiting for some investor to pick my brand up, I opened up my own store in Harlem, Infamous, on 132nd Street and 8th Avenue. I wanted to open up in Queens, but it was $10,000 a month for a small spot on Jamaica Avenue, while a way bigger spot in Harlem was only $2,000. I was moving too fast, But you have to move on ideas fast. So I got my first storefront. Dave Mays and Benzino ran ads in the source to promote the clothing brand and store. After my first infamous ads, all of a sudden, Rockaware, Sean John, Outkast Clothing, Fat Joe's, FJ560, and others began to emerge. I was pissed. Because in this business, it's all about who does it big first or at least second. If you do it third or fourth, then it's called dig riding and biting. But after 1999, all the rules of the game went out the window, and everybody was copying off of everybody. It wasn't about who did it first anymore. It was about who did it best. I put $20,000 into building the store, which was a gutted out, empty storefront when I moved in. The Tats crew painted a mural of all five New York City boroughs on the ceiling. Everything was on fire, and it looked like the apocalypse. 
I had a hookup at Home Depot and put in stone floors and gates with barbed wire so it looked like prison in there. On the store awning, our dragon logo lit up at night. My man Keith owned the women's clothing boutique next door to my spot. A week before our huge grand opening block party that he helped me put together at the park up the street, some people tried robbing Keith's store while he was opening up. Keith popped one of them and killed the other. I was glad he did that because it let other would-be robbers know not to fuck around on our block. He wasn't charged because he had a legal firearm to protect his business. Buster Rhymes came to the block party. My brother Greg came from New Jersey to help run the opening and brought his daughter, Kenesha, and son, Kenny. No more than 10 minutes after my brother, niece, and nephew arrived, a kid passing by on a pedal dirt bike shot a man in front of us. After shooting the victim, he got off the bike, picked up the gun shell, hopped back on the bike, and rode off slowly like nothing happened. The day wasn't off to a good start. Queensbridge came deep, and the whole hood bought at least one infamous shirt. We walked to the park and chilled for about an hour. Sadat X from Brand Nubian was there, and everybody was having a good time until some Harlem dudes started beefing with my Queensbridge niggas, and Queensbridge shut the park down. Those Harlem boys got their asses whooped in their own part of town. We walked back to the store to let things cool off. I locked up and told my brother and Kiki it was best that they left. I didn't want them around and somebody tried to shoot at us. Before they left, Kiki and I snapped a picture in front of the park. She's holding our son Shaka leaning up against the car I bought her. We hung out at the park all night just to prove a point. We're not scared. On grand opening day, I started thinking about putting my money elsewhere. I was already overspending to run that business. I needed all the money I had to shoot my movie. So I made a quick decision and chose the film over the store. I shut the store down a month after the block party and some dude bought it and turned it into a weed spot. They kept the dragon up over the door. My crib in Brooklyn started getting hot right before we released Murder Music. White Lines was playing in the clubs and on the airwaves more than any of our past songs, and the whole neighborhood knew that Prodigy from Mob Deep lived there. One summer night, a bunch of kids and teenagers rang my bell, screaming up in my window for me to come outside and battle them. It was time to move. I was the only one on that block with a buggy out bands, Lexus GS300, and Infinity J30, so I had the spotlight on me. Coming home from the studio at 4 a.m., I'd walk up to my apartment with my gun in my hand inside my pocket and finger on the trigger. That part of Bushwick wasn't particularly active with gun violence, but I was always ready. When Kiki and I took our son to the movies, the park, a restaurant, or shopping, I always had the 9mm Ruger in the baby bag, under the stroller, or on my hip. Instead of waiting for trouble to happen, Kiki and I started looking for a new crib. Meanwhile, at the mini mansion in Long Island, Papa Ma was hungry one afternoon. Scrounged two dollars in dimes and nickels lying around the house and walked six blocks to the Chinese spot. He got back to the crib and had eaten two of his three chicken wings Then Bolo rang on the doorbell. Papa Ma let him in then ran upstairs to use the bathroom. Bolo ate Papa Ma's last chicken wing. I was hungry, man, Bolo said defensively when Papa Ma flipped out. Papa was just as tired of Bolo as I was. He got his gun, went into the living room, and shot Bolo in the leg, just like I wanted to do. Bleeding like a pig, Bolo called the police and told on Papa. Well, Papa got off in the end. I wanted to hug and kiss Papa Mob. I was so glad he shot that bitch-ass nigga. During radio interviews, they bring up that situation. So, I had people getting shot at your house over a piece of chicken. 
Mob Deep hungry, huh? At around 10 p.m. on March 18, 1999, Kiki, Shaka, and I were in our Brooklyn apartment watching TV. Kiki went into the bathroom and came out all frantic, telling me her water broke while she was on the toilet. In the delivery room at St. John's Hospital, the doctor said she wasn't ready to give birth yet, but the baby could come out at any time. I stayed with her for a couple of hours, then walked to White Castle to get some fish sandwiches, onion rings, and apple pies. I love White Castle apple pies, and ate like four back to back. Kiki kept asking for some onion rings. The doctor said she couldn't eat anything, but she demanded that I give her some. At 3.03 a.m. on March 19, 1999, my daughter Fatasia was born. Watching my second child's birth was just as amazing as the first. I followed the doctors again, paranoid about them injecting my baby girl with those suspicious vaccines. Tasia looked like a little old Jewish lady when she was born, all wrinkled up and tiny. But I was excited to have a daughter. Around that time, Twin kept bugging me about this rap duo from Queensbridge named Balls and Hooks. You need to sign these kids to a deal. They've got talent, Twin said. I finally got tired of him harassing me, so we found him, and they started rapping for me outside on the block in QB. I couldn't front. They was hot. The front man of the duo, Mike DeLorean, a.k.a. Hooks, was from Haz Block and famous in the hood because his parents were both heavy into the drug game and had close ties to the Queens gang, the Supreme Team. DeLorean always had the best new clothes, mopeds, and motorcycles. DeLorean was also famous in the hood for this verse he spit on Cormega's song, This and Nas. Nas started a group called The Firm with Foxy Brown, Cormega, Nature, and himself. When it came time to promote the group, Nas didn't tell Mega about the important photo shoots, including magazine covers. Mega was furious after that. Then Nas kicked Mega out the group. Mega was on a fuck Nas mission ever since. Mega and Mike DeLorean killed Nas on a popular mixtape freestyle. So I knew DeLorean was nice with rap. Mr. Bars, DeLorean's rap partner, had some sick punchlines too. They reminded me of a younger version of Mom Deep. I signed them the infamous records right away. Balls and Hooks said they were getting threats from guys at Lynchman Entertainment, a record company they had signed a deal with before signing with me. DeLorean explained to me that when Lynchman found out that Balls and Hooks signed with me, they tried to intimidate him and Balls by claiming that they were responsible for getting Tupac shot at Quad Studios. And if Balls and Hooks didn't want that to happen to them, then they had to pay back whatever money Lynchman had spent on them or dead the infamous deal. They later denied any involvement in Tupac's shooting. To resolve this situation, I set up a meeting with Lynchman for Friday of that week. Havoc and I recorded the entire Murder Music album at Soundtrack Studios on 21st Street and Broadway. The session started at noon and usually ended around 5 a.m. Along with Murder Music, I was grinding on h and my movie soundtrack, and revisions of my movie script. Early one afternoon, Mike DeLorean came by the studio with his uncle Green Eyes, who just came home from doing 15 years for a robbery he claimed he didn't even do. Green Eyes was a member of the Supreme Team, and when a few of them got pinched for bank robbery, the police arrested Green Eyes, and he took the weight for whoever was involved. When he first introduced himself, I wasn't feeling him at all. He was real cocky, like, What up? My name Green Eyes. You probably heard of me in the streets. Bragging how he was locked up with this one and that one. My only focus was music, so I really didn't give a fuck about all the shit he was talking Green Eyes was living with DeLorean at his mom's crib in QB and started coming to the studio with him every day. He wasn't really DeLorean's uncle. I think he used to sex DeLorean's moms and they used that uncle so the little nigga wouldn't feel bad. 
After a few days, I realized Green Eyes was cool. He was just an OG suspended in time. 1984 to be exact. He told me how the gang leader, Supreme McGriff, didn't take care of him while he was locked up and never sent his family money. Damn, this nigga did 15 years for them. Friday came, and I told Green Eyes I was meeting with Lynchman about the story I heard from Bars and Hooks. DeLorean hadn't told him about it. He asked if he could come and said that he'd just sit there and say nothing. Lynchmen would think twice about all that thug shit they pop in when they see me, because they know me from the streets, Green Eyes said. At the Lynchman offices, DeLorean, Green Eyes, and I listened to Lynchman's appeal. They said that Balls and Hooks couldn't sign with Infamous Records, and they wanted to be paid back for the studio time, electric bills, and the phone calls made on the group's behalf. Lynchman had a compilation album coming out, so I told them that Balls and Hooks and I would do a song for it free of charge if they would squash everything. They agreed. I decided to introduce Balls and Hooks to the world through two freestyles. One over Melly Mel's The Message and another over Frankie Beverly's Outstanding. I pressed up 5,000 records with Balls and Hooks stickers and the infamous records logo, got the national DJ mailing list and contacted thousands of DJs about my plans for the new label and group. Then shipped records to all of them. I had seen how the loud staff did it, so I just did it myself. My brain was working like a robot, and my energy was through the roof. Late one night at Soundtrack Studios, Twin called, saying that he was bringing his kid, who had some hot beats, and was down with DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill. Twin showed up a couple hours later with a white kid dressed in khakis and an Adidas jacket like he was straight out of Compton. He introduced himself as Alchemist and put a dat tape in the player. The first few beats were cool, but one made me go crazy. As soon as I heard it, I claimed it for the Mom Deep album. We put Coogee Rap on the song and called it The Realist. I wrote a real crazy verse. Never prejudge, it be the humble that it squeeze slugs. It be the niggas saying it still that appeal guns. Spill blood for my niggas thugging for me. Man, you don't want to get involved fucking with P. I spent more nights illin', less nights chillin'. The more shots it hold, the better they feel it will be the dealings. Alchemist had many more where that beat came from and has been a part of the team ever since. I'm very leery and suspicious of new faces. And initially I thought Alchemist was a fed or some type of undercover agent trying to dig up some dirt on me and my boys. My initial thoughts were, oh, the police think they slick. They got agents who know how to make beats now. But when Alchemist came around with all those dope beats and I saw how serious he was about his career, I embraced him like a brother. He was like a gift from the heavens. That white boy got a lot of soul. We made up nicknames for him like White Chocolate, The White Vulture, and The Red White Bird. Just as we were ready to hand in the album, Loud Records switched distributors from RCA to Sony Columbia, and our album was pushed back three months until the deal was finalized. We were pissed. Loud had a whole new staff after the deal was done, and while they were going through those changes, our album got bootlegged. Murder Music was one of the most bootleg albums of all time. We had to record four new songs before we put it out so the fans would still want to buy it. My song White Lines was getting hot and it was time to give it a real name, so I called it Quiet Storm. Havoc and Chris Lighty wanted Quiet Storm for Murder Music instead of H&IC because Mob Deep needed a big single, but I refused to give it up at first. After a week of Havoc and Chris's convincing, though, I gave in and gave my solo song to Mob Deep. Lil' Kim and Havoc were on the remix, and we shot videos for both my version and the remix. Rumors had been going around that Kim didn't write any of her music, so I was impressed when I saw how Kim killed her verse and wrote it herself. 
The four new songs we made for our album were Spread Love Not War, Adrenaline, Where Your Heart At, and Quiet Storm Remix featuring Lil' Kim. The Sunday before Murder Music dropped, one of Havoc's homies from Queensbridge, Fakey, came home from doing nine years for shooting at some cops. I went to Freeport to visit Hav, and Fakey was sitting in the kitchen looking happy to be home, being real cool and humble. I didn't know Fakey very well. He was Havoc's boy. I met him once or twice when I first came to Queensbridge, but he got locked up right after that. I told Fakey we were having an album release party at the tunnel the following Sunday and that I'd give him 12 VIP passes. Sunday rolled around and I called Fakey to meet in the early evening on 21st Street in Queensbridge so I can give him the passes. Fakey pulled up in a white limousine with a gang of people called Mega, Ice, Spank, Nut, and a bunch of others. I gave him 12 passes and told him to arrive early because the passes were only good until 11 p.m. He agreed, and then I jetted to Alchemist's crib to meet Havoc and the crew. Club security tried to rush us into the tunnel after midnight because the cops were shutting the doors down. You got a bunch of people at the side door trying to get in. They say they with you, one of the security guards told me. How many people? I asked. Twelve. It was Fakey and his crew. I told the security that they had VIP passes. Two cops walked up. All right, we're closing the doors for good. You people are either going in or out. Make up your mind. I tried my best to talk to the cops and let them know this was our party, but they started getting pussy. Either go in or you're staying out. Fuck them niggas, P. We got to do this show. Havoc yelled, heading through the door. Let's go. I told Havoc to wait a minute. I didn't want to leave Fakie and his boys outside without at least trying to help them get in. Can I leave one of my boys here with you to point them out so they can get in? I asked the club security. Please, man. They belong inside with us. They all have passes. He looked at me like he wanted to help. Those passes are only good until 11 p.m. It's almost 1 o'clock, he said. Then pause. Okay, leave one of your boys with me. I'll see what I can do. I left golf over at the door with him and went inside. The club was jam-packed. When we hit the stage to perform, the crowd went crazy. Our first time performing in the tunnel, after all those years of hanging out there. My Benz was parked outside the front door. And as soon as we stepped outside after popping bottles in the VIP, I saw Fakie and his crew looking disappointed because they couldn't get in. Fakie walked up to me, and the police told me to move my car. Go meet me around the block so we could talk, I told Fakie. Around the corner, we get out the rides to talk on the sidewalk. Fakie told me that Ice's car was stolen while they were trying to get in. And Ice wanted me to pay for it. <laughs> tell Ice to get out the car and tell me that himself, I said. Fakie got Ice. I knew Ice way better than I knew Fakie from partying together in the tunnel for years while Fakie was locked up. Ice had a dumbass look on his face when he walked up. Like he knew he was about to tell me some bullshit, and he also knew that I wasn't going to go for it. My car's missing. I don't know if it got stolen or towed, he said. That's not my problem, I said. I'm not paying for it. Forget about it, P. It's not your fault, I said, and got back in the car. Don't even worry about it. Niggas just mad because they couldn't get in, Fakie said. I tried to convince them to let y'all in, but y'all came too late. I told you the passage was only good till 11, I said. At least you tried, he said. We really mad at Havoc because we grew up with him and it seemed like he didn't give a fuck about us. While Fakie was speaking, somebody got out the car to take a piss on the corner. I couldn't see who it was from where I was standing. Engaged in the conversation, I didn't take notice as a kid snuck around some cars, moving toward me, snuffing me in my nose. I dropped to the ground, unaware of who or what hit me. As I was getting up, I saw it was a little dirty nigga worm. He lifted the chain off my neck while I was still in the daze, and he ran to get back inside the car. Yo, what the fuck is you doing? 
fakie scream as if confused. But right away I suspected these niggas set me up. Why would they have worm with them when they're fully aware of all the situations with him and Mob Deep? They want to set me up? I'm the one who gave them 12 passes. Havoc always told me, stop hanging out on QB, don't trust them niggas. But it's not my style to cut everybody off because of a few bad apples in the bunch. I was one of the only niggas in Queensbridge actively shooting videos, movies, showing love to the up-and-coming artists, and keeping close ties when everybody else stopped coming around. I wasn't trying to be something that I'm not. I didn't let money or fame make me paranoid to the point where I was scared to come to the hood. I didn't have a reason to have fear in my heart because I'm genuine. Only liars have fear because they scared somebody will catch on to their lies. The only reason I stopped dealing with a person was if they did something foul to me and nobody from QB ever did nothing foul until then. Worm snatched my chain and then ran. I popped open my car's hood to get my gun out to shoot up that piece of shit Land Rover that he, fakey, spanked, mega, and ice were in. I looked over at Stobo, and he already knew what I was thinking. The only thing that stopped me from punching holes in that Jeep was ice and Cormega. If they wasn't in there, I'd probably be doing murder time right now. Fakie and Worm thought they were so gangster, but a real gangster nigga almost put an end to their career as petty crooks that night. I sat in the driver's seat with the gun on my lap, itching, to show these wannabe thugs how I got down. But my better judgment caused me to pull off. I catch them soon enough. Godfather called later that night, telling me that Fakie and Worm robbed Noid in Queensbridge and hit him in the head with a bottle. Somebody needs to kill one of these bummy ass clowns. At home that night, when Kiki saw my swollen face and asked what happened, I broke down crying, and it was embarrassing telling her what happened. All the years I've been in QB, I never had problems with people, because my hand didn't call for that. I wanted to murder one of these niggas for making me go home to my woman like that. The following morning, I called Fakie and told him to meet me in Queensbridge to give me my chain back. Fakie said he got it from Worm and could meet me whenever I was ready. I called Hav to tell him what was going on. Don't go, Pete. Don't trust him. He kept telling me. You shouldn't go to QB no more. Man, listen, fuck all that, I said. I'm not scared of these bitch-ass niggas. I'm gonna get my chain back. Havoc was just looking out for my safety. But what he was telling me was the total opposite of how my pops raised me. When I got to the projects... I called Fakie, and he told me that he had to go to the studio with Nas, and we could meet by the hit factory in Manhattan. Mind you, I'm by myself. No army, no gang, no soldiers. It's me and my nine Ruger. Even if I wanted a gang, I didn't have anybody to turn to because my gang was telling me, don't do it, don't go. The only person who said they would roll with me was Jonathan Lighty and I didn't even ask him to roll. When I got to the hit factory, Fakie and Cormega met me outside, and Fakie put my chain on my neck. It made me feel like a herb, like he was doing me a favor or something. You okay? Mega asked. Yeah, I said. My eye was turning black from being punched in the nose. Fakie and Mega looked at me shaking their heads as if to feel sorry for me. Wanna come to the Nas session with us? Fakie asked. Fuck it, why not? I wanted to show them that I wasn't scared. So we walked into the session. I talked to Fakie and Nas about Worm. Fakie kept telling me that he didn't know Worm was gonna do that. Blah, blah, blah. As long as Fakie gave me my chain back, it wasn't a problem for now. But Worm was definitely gonna have to get dealt with ASAP. The next morning, Kiki and I decided to move into a hotel until we found a new crib. Loud Records paid for us to stay in a three-bedroom penthouse at the Flat Hotel in Manhattan, a luxury skyscraper on 52nd Street and Broadway, for two months. 
Murder Music went platinum within those two months. And we were on top of the world. After the lame setup that Fakie and Worm pulled at the tunnel, the very next Sunday, Worm was walking around the tunnel and one of my boys from Hempstead cracked his face open with a Moet bottle. Worm didn't know who broke that bottle on his face or why. So just to tell people he had gotten revenge, the Sunday after that, Worm went back to the tunnel with a gun and opened fire on a random parked car. After shooting half his gun clip into the car, killing a young man in the driver's seat and wounding the others, Worm tried to run. But three undercover cops jumped out of a car right next to the car Worm shot up, yelling, Freeze! Drop the gun! Worm fired shots at the cops while running to his car, with the cops chasing and shooting at him. The cops shot up Worm's ride, riddling his body with bullets and almost killing him. Worm got 50 years to life. See, Pete? Twin told me. When people try to do foul shit, all we gotta do is sit back and wait. Because karma's gonna get our revenge for us. Ironically, the random young man who Worm killed that night just so happened to be the boyfriend of Kiki's homegirl. Kiki and I found a mini mansion on the mountaintop in a town called Pomona in Rockland County, 40 minutes from Manhattan. I paid $500,000 for the house. Five bedrooms, three car garage, and two acres of land. During our first week there, my daughter Taser took her first steps in our bedroom. She was scared and started crying at first, but I held her hand as we walked together. Then I let go real slow, and she finally did it. She took ten steps on her own. Chapter 8 H-N-I-C. I'm being watched by snake eyes, peeked them shed skin plenty times, surrounded by crash dummies and empty minds. Get your shit together, done, see between the lines, stay awoke to the ways of the wickedest kind. Infamous, cause of the way I write rhymes. Genesis. Soon after Murder Music went platinum, in 1999, we hit the road for two months on the Family Values Tour. Our biggest tour yet, with Limp Biscuit, Run DMC, and a bunch of rock acts. 60 shows across America, 30,000 people a night. We took Noid and Stobo along, and Alchemist was our DJ. If we thought we knew something about groupies, we hadn't seen shit until we seen rock star groupies. Chicks lined up in packs to get inside Limp Bizkit's dressing room after the show. We were in front of a huge crowd every night, so it was important for us to put together a real theatrical performance. There were barbed wire fences on stage, and Alchemist introduced us like we were coming home from jail to perform. Security guards walked us onto the stage handcuffed and shackled in orange prison uniforms. The guards uncuffed us, and we went crazy running around with a lot of energy. The white kids in the audience loved us. I didn't know how they were going to respond to us because most of our past shows were in the hood. But the crowd knew every word to our songs, especially Quiet Storm and Shook Ones. Man, we had a lot of fun on that tour. After the shows, we chilled with Limp Biscuit in their dressing room and tour bus. Alchemist was cool with their DJ, Lethal, who was House of Pain's DJ and produced their hit, Jump Around. Al met him growing up in Los Angeles through DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill. Lethal had a nice studio set up on their bus, so we hung out and made music. One night, after the show, Limbisca had a dentist backstage with a big tank of happy gas, nitrous oxide, filling up giant balloons and handing them out to get high. One dude took a whole balloon, and as he stumbled off, he fell flat on his face. I took a whole balloon to the head, and that shit felt crazy. My boy Stobo took one too. We roamed around backstage feeling like we were floating, fucking with the girls. Havoc would never try nothing like that, but I was like, fuck it, you only live once. I figured if this is the stuff that 
we get at the dentist's office, then what harm could it do? I can't even remember what it felt like. It just made me laugh a lot. Ja Rule was on the tour for a few weeks, and we shared the same dressing room with him one day. I never really liked Ja's music. I understood his female targeted songs, but where I'm from, nobody listens to Ja Rule. A few years earlier, Steve Rifkin invited me and a few of my dudes to some dress up party in the city. I'll be there, but I'm coming in my street clothes, I told Steve. That's cool, he said. I just want you there. We look real thugged out compared to the rest of the crowd. Then Ja Rule walked into the party in a loosely knitted sweater with his nipples practically popping out the spaces in the knit. It looked real homosexual. I would pay good money to see the embarrassed look on his face again when he saw us standing there. The dudes I was with didn't have any mercy, laughing right in front of him. So, on tour, we had to share the same dressing room with this dickhead, and he was putting on an ice grill, acting like he was tough now and too big to even talk to us. Something had definitely changed. The tour ended right before the new year. We went home and got our platinum plaques for Murder Music. The plaques had blood splashes on them just like our album cover. I started hitting the studio every day to finish H&IC and and the Murder Music movie soundtrack. I asked DeLorean and Drawers from Havoc's Block to help me find some new rappers from QB for the soundtrack. And they started spreading the word. I showed a lot of niggas love on that soundtrack and gave a lot of dudes their first check ever, paying people $2,500 for a song or a beat. Nas was working on an album called QB's Finest at that same time. I found out that his QB album stood for Queensboro. He was getting all the Queens rappers together like LL Cool J, Coogee Rap, Run DMC, The Lost Boys. But when Nas heard about what I was doing, with the new rappers from the bridge, he changed his Queensboro into Queens Bridge because he didn't want me to be the first to get all the new artists from QB together. Nas saw himself as king of Queens Bridge, so he had to be the first to pull it off. Nas didn't know that I had people around him who would come tell me everything. Nas started booking studio sessions in a room right next to me in Soundtrack Studios. So whoever I had come and doing songs, he could intercept and have them come over to his session too. Funny ass nigga. Ever since I first started coming to Queensbridge with Havoc in 1989, Nas always acted as if he was too good to fuck with Marv Deep. He started doing songs with us after Shook Ones blew up, but Nas treated it like it was strictly business. He never tried to hang out or be cool with us. And definitely not me. Probably because he thought I was whack at first. That's understandable. I would have acted the same way if I was him. But while we were both working at Soundtrack Studios, I learned that Nas was suddenly being managed by Chris Lighty. And he started calling my crib like he really wanted to be homies now. Kiki would tell me that Nas called. We were both in shock. Why the sudden drastic change of heart? The only thing I can attribute it to is the platinum success of murder music. One day, Nas asked me to join his session and spit something for the QB's finest. I did a verse on a song called The Bridge 2001. Me and my dogs coming through, we the grain, go against us, you feel the pain. After I laid my verse, Nas and I kicked it for a few hours for the first time talking about the rap game. I told him that I thought Jay-Z was taking shots at Marv Deep in his song, Where I'm From, on In My Lifetime, Volume 1. Jay had a line in that song. I'm from the place where you and your little mans hung out in every verse in your rhymes. The only person in the history of rap music who talked about Marcy Projects in a verse was yours truly, me, on the infamous song, Trife life. I rhymed. Every angle of the car was smoked out and tinted, so we couldn't tell if the enemy was in it. It might have been TNT. I wasn't trying to wait and see we 
jetted through Marcy because D's ain't backing me. Jay was definitely talking about me. On the song, Money Cash Hoes, with DMX, Jay said, New York's been soft ever since Snoop came through and crushed the buildings. I'm trying to restore the feelings. Jay was quieter than the church mouse when the Snoop and Pac, Mob Deep, and Biggie drama was on fire. Jay was nowhere around when all that shit with Pac was popping off. But that's how it was in rap. Niggas always going at each other, saying slick shit in their rhymes. If you said something slick, I caught it. And best believe, I came right back at you. Jay wasn't shooting videos in the projects until he saw your video halftime and our shook ones and survival of the fittest videos, I pointed out to Nas. The projects ain't even Jay style. He was on some speedboat, Versace, champagne party in the Bahamas getting the tan type shit. Before his success, I had seen Jay at different functions over the years, but mostly at Club Esso, where he threw Cristal parties. Biggie used to come through too. I knew Jay style because I watched him come up. And now Jay was copying our style. Plus, Jay and his little rap protege, Memphis Bleak, were dissing Nas on songs without saying Nas's name. We should put Jay on blast in our verses for biting our style and taking subliminal shots at us, I told Nas. Nah, fuck him, Nas said. He ain't nobody to be dissing. All right, cool, I replied. I'm going to deal with him on my own. Nas didn't see what I saw. I knew exactly what Jay was doing, taking cheap shots on the low. Fuck that. Jay wanted to take indirect shots. It was my turn to shoot directly at him. Jay-Z had animosity towards Nas because he wanted Nas to be in his In My Lifetime video. Nas refused. Jay even got Nas's phone number from E Money Bags and called Nas personally, but Nas still wouldn't do it. Things were about to boil over. The next day, I started working at Soundtrack early, aiming to complete four songs per day. Clean and sober again after the Limp Biscuit tour, I didn't allow anyone to smoke in Studio A while I was working. Changing my life for the better eventually helped Kiki to quit the weed and poisonous bullshit just like me. Cameron was in a session with a hot new producer down the hall. Cam introduced me to the producer and asked me to do a song with him for his album. I wrote my rhyme in about 20 minutes and laid it down. Then Cam came up with the chorus. The song, Losing Weight, ended up being a hood classic. Cam asked me about the dragon tattoo on my hand, and I explained that our whole Mall D crew had it on our right hands. Cam then showed me a tattoo on the back side of his palm. Diplomats, written in script. Before I went back to my own session, Cameron told me, Yo, P, you should come hang out with me and my boys in Harlem one day. Who's Cameron? Kiki asked late the following night. He called for you today. Cam started calling my crib looking for me. He sounds real cocky on the phone. Like I'm supposed to be excited to speak to him, Kiki said. I never called Cam back. Not because I didn't like him. I had nothing against Cam. But because I didn't like new people trying to be too cool with me. I wasn't trying to hang out with him and his crew in Harlem because my mind was in a whole nother space at that time. Strictly business. I got word from my man in Queensbridge that Little Law was home. I'm doing seven years for that carjacking back in 93. The same kid I sold my accurate to when he was the youngest drug dealer in the hood, running around with Killer Black getting into shootouts. I scooped him up from Brooklyn and took him to Soundtrack Studio. He said he was rapping now and went by the name Littles. I was happy that he wanted to change his life around, so I cut him a check and had him put a song on the movie soundtrack. I even let him lay an eight-bar acapella on H&IC so he can get his buzz started. Little Lord seemed like a different person now, no longer acting like the cocky, ruthless badass. He was acting real humble and happy to be free. Right after Little Lord came home, Hazman Freeha from QB was also released from prison 
for murdering a cab driver on 21st Street in Queensbridge. At Soundtrack Studios, Freeha, who came home with two razor slashes across both sides of his face from a fight in Rikers Island, explained that he beat the murder rap because his lawyer proved that Freeha couldn't have killed the man since he was the one that called 911 from the payphone up the block. Not only did he beat the murder, but Freeha also sued the New York Department of Corrections and won $40,000 for getting cut in jail. Freeha had turned into a blood in jail and also turned into a rapper. Chris Lighty threw a big violator records party in South Beach, Miami. Mob Deep was on the bill to perform with Buster Rhymes. So Havoc and I brought our whole crew. We stayed at the Shelbourne Hotel. I stopped by my mother's apartment to surprise her. She had gotten tired of New York and moved to Miami around 96. I took Alchemist and Gotti along so moms could meet Al. We talked for about an hour, then hopped back on our scooters and rode around South Beach. Later that afternoon, Alchemist and I jumped into a mini golf cart looking vehicle and drove to Soundcheck at Club Amnesia, where palm trees grew from the dance floor up into the open ceiling sky. Alchemist and I were waiting to check out the sound system when we overheard a conversation between two guys. Yeah, I hear Marv Deep is gonna perform tonight, one of them said. Those guys think they're so tough and gangster. I don't like them at all. I brushed it off as cheap talk. But during sound check, I noticed that the guy who was talking was the sound man for the show. The spot was jam-packed later that night as we stood by the bar watching Rod Digger open up for Buster with some girls behind her in tacky patent leather outfits that said Flip Mode Squad all over. Buster is always an extremely hard act to follow. After two songs, our mic started to sound terrible with loud feedback while the music was extra low. Yo, you better fix this shit. I screamed at the sound man. You fucking up our show. But it only got worse. Wow, this dude really purposely fucked up our show because he don't like us, I thought. Remembering what I overheard him saying earlier. The sound for Buster's set had been perfect. After the fourth song, we had to end our show because it sounded awful. I found Chris Lighty and I told him, I know this is your party, so out of respect, I'm coming to you to tell you that I'm about to beat the sound man up. Okay, cool, Chris said. Are you sure? I asked. I'm not playing. Come on, I'll help you find him, Chris said. Chris brought me right to the sound man. Excuse me, my man, I said. Can I ask you a question? Do you have something personal against me and my team? Did we do something to you? No, I don't have a problem with you guys, he said. I don't know what happened, the sound was just acting up. I pretended like I was turning to walk away while cocking back my arm so I could knock him out. I swung with my right fist, hit him dead in the mouth with my platinum ring, knocked out his two top teeth, then quickly walked to the bathroom to wash the blood off my hand and swapped shirts with our security guard, Tim. I gave Tim my royal blue throwback Braves jersey with white short sleeves, and he gave me his mustard brown striped polo shirt. The cops had all the club exits blocked off. Luckily, I switched shirts, because when we walked out, the cops tackled Tim to the ground with guns at his head. While they struggled with Tim on the ground, Chris Lighty's older brother, Dave Lighty, walked with me in the opposite direction and paid some fool $100 to give me his scooter so I could zip out quick. Tim got arrested and we bailed him out the next day. He had to go to trial for that and lost his gun license. I gave Tim some bread for doing that for me. And then, like a month or two later, the sound man sued me for $20,000 for his dental bill (laughs) and won. Working on music at our Long Island house one day, Hav told me he wanted to throw a gangster party at the crib that weekend. What's a gangster party? I asked. A sex party, an orgy, Hav said. We invite like 10 females that know what the party is all about, 
then we invite just a few close friends and get it popping, a gangster party. Oh, oh, okay, I said. Let's do it. Have it call some strippers and some girls we knew who were down for whatever. We invited Nas, L.E.S., and Little Lord. Gotti, Noid, Papa Mob, Twin, and Ty Nitty lived at the house, so they were automatically invited. Havoc also invited a female rapper named Shottown, who was bisexual, so there'd be lots of females for her to have fun with. The night of the party, I picked Little Lord up from Brooklyn, and we pulled up to the Freeport crib. Havoc had disco lights flashing throughout the whole place. Nas and L.E.S., pulled up at the same time as us. Females were walking all over the house in bikinis or nothing on at all. I poured a cup of Moet and have told Nas and me to follow him up to his room where four chicks were waiting for us. They pulled out condoms and started giving us all top at the same time. The tall, thick, dark-skinned cutie who was giving me head suddenly stopped, pulled me behind her, and got on her hands and knees. So I started hitting her tall ass from the back while she began giving head to the girl who was sucking Nas's dick. We had him in all kinds of freaky positions and had room for about 40 minutes. Then I bounced downstairs and left having Nas in the room with the girls. I was finished. I poured another cup of Moet and enjoyed the scenery. Havoc and Nas came downstairs as Chi-Town walked in. Half grabbed her by the arm and made her sit on the couch and half had two other females take her pants off. Stop, what y'all doing? Chi-Town yelled, acting shy because Nas was standing there watching. The two females pulled her panties off and started eating her out. Stop, come on. Chi-Town resisted. What are y'all doing? But suddenly she was speechless, pushing the girls' faces deeper into her. I left early and took my ass back home to Kiggy. When she asked me where I've been, I told her we were working on music. But she ain't stupid. Women's intuition is powerful. It seemed like Kiki always knew when I was being bad. Shit, what was I supposed to say? I was at Hav's gangster party? Ron Artest had become a big-time NBA star for the Chicago Bulls. And when he heard about what I was doing with Balls and Hooks in the Queensbridge movie, he gave me $90,000 and startup money to help with the expenses. Studio time, records, stickers, travel expenses, infamous records chains for DeLorean and bars, and infamous records levers, jerseys, t-shirts, and bandanas to promote the label. Ron Ron, as we called him, was a real ass nigga for looking out like that. To this day, if he asked me for anything, I would do it for him. The new millennium came, and the entire world was on pins and needles, thinking the end was here. News channels were spreading fear. Supermarket shelves were empty from people stocking up on food and water. On New Year's Eve 1999, instead of going to the tunnel, Justin's, or Cheetah's, as usual, Kiki and I played it safe and popped champagne while watching the ball drop on TV at home. It was finally 2000, and contrary to what everybody thought, nothing happened. In rural Rockland County, when the ball dropped, all we heard was gunfire from machine guns and pistols. I thought a war had started. I forgot that we were up in the mountains with redneck, deuce of hazard white people who hunt deers and bears. Kiki and I made our own porno movie and went to sleep. I bumped into my boy from Left Rack, Shamik's homeboy, E Money Bags, on my way to Chung King Studio by the Holland Tunnel in Manhattan. Bags and I always randomly crossed paths. He loved Mob Deep. You the god, Pete, for killing these niggas with Quiet Storm, he said. Bags was a well known ghetto celeb. The female rapper Foxy Brown even shouted him out on the firm song, Affirmative Action. Bags and I started hanging out every day after that, talking for hours about the Illuminati, secret societies, the corrupt government, and history of the Moors. Our appetite for hidden knowledge was the main thing we had in common. 
Bags invited me along to visit his homie, 50 Cent, a new rapper with a hot single called How to Rob, who was recovering from multiple gunshot wounds. He said 50 was asking about me. I told Bags that I didn't really know 50 like that and wasn't going to make it. After Killer Black's wake in Queensbridge and identifying my father's body in Atlanta, I told myself I wouldn't go to any more wakes or funerals. The crew was mad at me for missing our boy Yammy's wake in Brooklyn, but I didn't want to see any more of my people in the casket. So even though 50 was alive, I didn't want to see him hurt up like that. Keep It Thorough was one of the last songs I recorded for h and The beat Alchemist made had a horn break that sounded like a natural hook, so I wrote the song without a chorus. Chris Lighty and others kept telling me, you can't just leave it like that. It needs a chorus with vocals to get radio play. But one of the lines on the song says, heavy airplay all day with no chorus. I keep it thorough, nigga. To have no chorus was the whole concept of the song. People liked my music because I didn't follow the rules. I did and said whatever I wanted. Kiki kept bugging me to let her rap on the album when I was 95% finished. Making a good quality album was more important to me than letting my wifey spit on the song. The way I saw it, she was just like everybody else who wanted to make a cameo on my album just because they knew me. I only do songs if it makes sense or sounds good. But then Alchemist made the perfect beat that sounded like a ghetto love story. Kiki and I sat up all night in our house in Pomona writing Trials of Love about a young couple going through the ups and downs of a music industry relationship. It was her first time in the mic booth, and I had her do the verse 30 times, but she ended up getting it right. Kiki had writing skills, but I didn't want my woman in the same business as me, so I told her it was just for fun, and it wasn't going any further than that. After the Limp Biscuit tour, Mob Deep did our own club tour across the country. It wasn't nothing compared to those big stadiums, but it was still good money. Balls and Hooks came along to get touring experience, and I noticed Havoc was keeping his distance from them. You could just tell that he didn't want to work with them. That's how Hav was. All he cared about was Mob Deep and his own music. DeLorean and Balls felt like Havoc was dissing them and took it personally. I realized Balls and Hooks were talented musically, but mentally, they weren't ready to deal with us. During the three-month break after the tour, I wrapped up h and The final song I recorded for it was You Can Never Feel My Pain about Sickle Cell. I thought it would be interesting to get TLC's T-Bars to sing on the chorus because she also had Sickle Cell. Steve Rifkin set up a meeting in the studio in Atlanta. I carried the two-inch rails with me on the flight. Two-inch rails are reel-to-reel tapes that we recorded all the music and vocals on before Pro Tools came out. T-Bars showed up an hour late to the studio with her then-husband, rapper Mac-10. T-Bars and I immediately started talking about how we dealt with Sickle Cell. When she heard the track, I wasn't pleased with her response. It sounds good, but I don't know if my label's gonna let me do it, she said when I stopped the music. I'll find out and get back to you. Right away, I knew she didn't want to do it. It's a shame. But she was cool as hell. Steve Rifkin told me the same thing T-Boss did. Her label doesn't like the idea of her being on a song with a gangster rapper, Steve said. So I just made a simple hook and my album was done. Steve Rifkin was serious about promoting my album and Lau started running magazine ads for h six months in advance. Since my album was called Head Nigga in Charge, I was sitting on the throne in the ads. The idea came from the end of the movie Conan the Barbarian, where Conan sat on the throne like he was king of the world. Keep It Thorough took off, and I hit the road again for my h and tour. Balls and Hooks came along with DeLorean's uncle, Green Eyes. I was training Green Eyes to be a role manager. His leg was still healing from being shot in the calf muscle by one of Supreme's boys. When Green Eyes came home from doing that 15, the first thing he did was step to Supreme about why he hadn't sent any money to him or his family while he was doing time. 
Green Eyes explained to me how he had to whip Supreme's ass. Supreme couldn't live with that ass whooping, so he had one of his boys shoot Green Eyes in the leg like five minutes after the fight. Wow. Green Eyes got up early every morning to walk around the hotels, building the strength back in his leg. The fans were feeling balls and hooks, but DeLorean kept bothering me about why Havoc didn't like them. Havoc don't gotta like you, nigga, I ended up screaming one day, but they still felt offended. Their logic was, Havoc is from our block. We grew up with Havoc, not you, Pete. Havoc should be showing us more love. Havoc wasn't obligated to do anything for them. They were signed to my company, not Mob Deep. Those were some hard-headed little bastards. We toured the entire East Coast and Midwest. And while we were in Chicago for a performance at our boy Ron Artest's birthday party, an interview I did in the source came out. I picked up a copy in the Chicago airport when we landed. The source put me on the cover, my first magazine cover as a solo artist. In the interview, the writer, Shaheen Reed, asked about my problem with Jay-Z, referencing an online interview in which they asked if I liked Jay-Z. No, he's a bitch boy. He talking and don't live it, I said. I elaborated for the source. Jay-Z has a quote in his song, Money Cash Holes, where he claims, New York been soft ever since Snoop came through and crushed the buildings. I'm trying to restore the feelings. But Jay was nowhere to be found when that drama popped off between Mob Deep, Dog Pound, Tupac, and Biggie. That was our little personal beef, not a coastal war. Jay-Z ain't had shit to say when it was on, and he was getting dissed. Him and Nas. Mob Deep and Biggie were the only ones from New York active in that situation. So Jay-Z is a bitch-ass nigga for making that quote in his lyrics. Yeah, it was on now. Ron Ron and a few of his boys from Queensbridge came to pop more wet with us at the hotel later that night before the party. I would drink a little champagne or wine occasionally. It's only a problem when you're down in bottles without any discipline. QB was deep in Shot town that night. The two-level club was packed. The VIP balcony wrapping around above the dance floor. I bought bottles for my boys with a bunch of fake $100 bills from my Keep It Thorough video that read for motion picture use only at the top instead of United States of America. By the time the club figured it out, we finished the bottles and we couldn't be found in the enormous crowd. Calls started coming in from industry folks when I arrived back in New York. Jay-Z is upset because of what you said about him. I was like, and? Am I supposed to give a fuck? Fuck him. I didn't call him a bitch boy to make him happy. I did it to provoke him to start dissing me. And I said it because it's the truth. The whole rap world was talking about me calling Jay-Z a bitch. Radio, magazines, websites, and all. It was only a matter of time before bitch boy came back at me with something. And that was exactly what I wanted. I knew most of the shooters and live wires from Jay-Z's hood and the other two projects near Marcy, Tompkins and Sumner. So I already knew who Jay-Z would run to. That's my advantage over him. That's how I knew he didn't live what he rapped. But Jay didn't realize I had those connections. My nigga E. Money Bags went to high school with Jay. And Bags' sister is married to Sauce Money, who was one of Jay-Z's artists. I had connections through the whole borough of Brooklyn, from Red Hook, Cypress, and Pink Houses to Brownsville, Crown Heights, and Bed-Stuy. When I openly expressed my opinion to Jay-Z to the world, it opened up the floodgates on him. Suddenly, several different rappers started openly saying the same things about him, from Fat Joe to The Locks and more. Even LL Cool J started firing shots at Jay. Jay has a line in one of his songs that goes, First the fat boys break up, now every day I wake up, somebody got a problem with Hov. The song is called Ain't No Love or some bitch boy shit like that. Let me be clear. Jay-Z makes excellent music. I really liked a lot of his stuff. But this was not about his music, and it had nothing to do with jealousy or envy. This was about the man behind all that, Sean Carter, a.k.a. Bozo the Clown. My situation with that dude wasn't a rap battle. It was personal. 
Touching up edits for the clean version of YBE, Young Black Entrepreneurs, featuring BG from Cash Money. My son Shaka joined me for a session at Soundtrack Studios. Shaka was five years old at the time. Mike DeLorean and my man George from Queensbridge also came along. My engineer, Steve Sola, told us that Nas was working in Studio B again that night. So we walked over to say what's up. When we walked in, we saw Nas, Jungle, Grand Wiz, Horse, and his brother Dula, and some dude we didn't know, along with a few females. DeLorean noticed some big buds of weed on the countertop, plus a few bottles of liquor in a camcorder. Right away, DeLorean picked up one of the buds to smell, and Nas got upset. Yo, why you touching that shit? That ain't yours, Nas asked. Damn, I'm just looking at the bud, DeLorean said. I wanted to smell it. Then, DeLorean picked up the camcorder and started to inspect it to see what kind it was. And Nas barked on him again. Yo, what the fuck is wrong with you, son? I told you stop touching other people's shit. Man, what the fuck is your problem? I'm going to look at it if I feel like looking at it. What's the big deal? DeLorean said. Nas was clearly a little drunk from the Grey Goose and cranberry juice in his hand and still had sour feelings about that old freestyle DeLorean and Cormega put out dissing him. He was also clearly upset that DeLorean was talking to him like that now. Nas walked up to DeLorean and motioned with the cup in his hand like he was going to toss the red drink in DeLorean's face, but paused and tossed it on the shoulder of DeLorean's white t-shirt. There was a moment of silence. Then DeLorean grabbed Nas by the throat with his right hand and pushed him up against the wall, choking him. Nigga, don't you ever in your life play yourself like that, DeLorean said. You fucking stupid or something? I'll kill you, bitch-ass nigga. All the Nas boys jumped up, but George yelled, Chill, if they gonna fight, let them fight one-on-one. -on -one. Ain't nobody gonna be jumping nobody here. I screamed at Mike DeLorean to let Nas go, and he did. Then we took DeLorean back to Studio A. My son Shock was watching it all in shock. Back in Studio A, DeLorean said, P, give me the gun. I'm shooting this bird-ass nigga. Give me the gun. And I replied, hell no, nigga. You bugging, man. You already choked him up against the wall and he ain't trying to fight you back. Just leave him alone. After about 10 minutes of calming him down, I went into the hallway and Nas walked up to me apologizing. I'm sorry, man. I, I had too much to drink. Nah, I said, please forgive me, man. It's all good. Just forget about it. That nigga's bugged out, though, I said. Nah, I'm really sorry. I'm telling you. I'm just bent right now, and I overreacted. Nah, I said, I shouldn't have done that. That was foul. Don't sweat it. We good, man, I said. And we both went back into our studio rooms. February 27th. 2009, Mid-State Correctional Facility, Marcy, New York, 10 a.m. On the wreck, the loud, obnoxious, military-style shout from the CO abruptly woke me up from my sleep. He was letting the whole dorm know it was time for recreation. Pulling myself off the steel cot attached to my cell wall, I forced myself to go to the yard. Come on, boy, let's go, I said to myself. You owe it to your family and to the people who love your music. Now get your ass out there and work out. It was raining hard, so I grabbed my green hoodie and workout gloves and ran to catch up with the other inmates. Out of 30 inmates in my dorm, only four of us went out to brave the weather. The yard at Mid State Correctional Facility is the size of a football field and has a large shed with plenty of weightlifting equipment, pull-up bars, dip bars, and concrete picnic tables. I went out every morning. You've been in the game 17 years. What makes you think people are still going to care about you when you get home? I constantly ask myself. My answer was always the same. Because of my ability to create music, my attitude about life, and my physical appearance, 
will all be better than it ever was. With all that in mind, I worked out hard for three hours every day. But I worked on my music and attitude more than anything, especially my attitude. My mother always told me, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. I didn't fully understand that until I was forced to sit in a cell and think about my whole life. Damn, I had a big mouth. I needed to tone it down. A lot. I enjoyed being a fearless badass, doing and saying things others were scared to. As a teenager, I got my kicks out of doing things like standing on a long department store line of white people and their children and reciting the lyrics to N.W.A.'s Niggas for Life. Why do I call myself a nigga, you ask me? Well, it's because motherfuckers won't blast me. Seeing how those lyrics made white people uncomfortable would make my day. My boys laughed hard afterwards, saying, Yo, you crazy, P. What's wrong with you? It was fun being bad. We smoked weed and drank big bottles of alcohol and train cars full of passengers, raw people in front of numerous witnesses, and wreaked havoc throughout the five boroughs. There weren't as many cameras, police, or thousands of tourists roaming the streets of Manhattan. If you were a teenager growing up in the five boroughs during that time, you know why I acted, talked, rapped, and carried myself the way I did. The concrete jungle education that New York City provided me is priceless. I'm sure it was similar in every inner city on the map, but nothing compares to the every man for himself state of mind that New Yorkers have. You won't find that level of ruthlessness anywhere in the U.S. The 80s and 90s were like gladiator school in the streets. My attitude was in sync with my environment. But change is imminent, and nothing stays the same. When I think back on all the things I've done in the streets, I realize how blessed I am to still be alive. Sometimes I feel like I'm in one of those movie scenes where everything is moving at light speed around the person in the middle who moves ever so slightly, slowly and calm. The tunnel started to die down, so we needed a new church to go to every Sunday. And the Latin Quarters, or LQ, was it. After one Sunday night service at LQ, we went to Nori's crib in West New York, New Jersey, for an after party with some females. I left early because I wasn't into all that wild after party stuff no more. I didn't make it more than four blocks in my Range Rover before I got pulled over by a New Jersey squad car for no damn reason. Oh, I forgot. I was black and driving an expensive car. The cops asked me for my license and registration. The young Latino officer recognized me. Prodigy, is that you? He asked. Yeah, what's up? I said. What's the problem? Did I do something wrong? No problem. We saw the Georgia plates and wanted to check everything out, the officer said. I'd recently bought a range from a kid, Loke, in Atlanta, who was connected to a tag car operation that bought cars off delivery trucks before they reached the dealership. I couldn't resist the dirt cheap price. 10000 bucks for a brand new black on black 4.6 range. The Latino officer's partner shined a flashlight on my window stickers and VIN number tag. Don't worry. We just want to check your VIN number on your engine to make sure it matches the one on your windshield because the windshield tag is falling off, he explained. Damn. I had taken the reins to the car wash earlier that day, and while cleaning my windshield and dashboard, they'd knock my tag loose. Pop your hood open and then we'll get you out of here. This was about to get bad. An all-black plastic 9mm with a rubber grip and laser sight was in the engine next to the battery. Two minutes later, the white cop said the code for gun to the Latino. Step out the vehicle, please, the Latino cop said. Turn around with your hands behind your back. I'm sorry, but you have a gun in your engine. We have to arrest you. They read me my rights, searched my truck, and found three nickel bags of weed 
in a jacket one of my boys left in the back seat. Fuck. They put me in the squad car and took me to the West New York precinct. The next morning, Kiki and Uncle Lenny bailed me out. As I was leaving the courthouse, two detectives walked up. Albert Johnson, we need to talk. Please step into the office. Shit. Where'd you get this truck from? One of the D's asked after seating me in the office. Damn, it's over now. I bought it from some guy in Atlanta, I said. He was selling it, so I bought it. Do you know the guy you bought it from? No. It said for sale in the window, so I negotiated a price. Well, this truck is stolen, the detective said. The tags don't match. Our people check the engine parts, and all the tags match except one. This is the best tag job we've seen. You know you bought a tag car, right? Don't lie, we already know. Hell no. I make music for a living, I said. I don't have to buy stolen cars. I got money. After 30 minutes of interrogation, they grew tired of trying to convince me to snitch, put the cuffs on, and rearrested me. They told Kiki and Uncle Lenny that I was now being charged with Grand Theft Auto and I would have to wait till tomorrow to see the judge again. The next day, the judge hit me with a $150,000 bail. I spent a few days in Newark County Jail until Steve Rifkin bailed me out. It was my second gun charge and my first stolen car. My lawyer Irv Cohen and I decided to take it to trial. I can't elaborate on the particulars here, but during the trial, Irv approached me in the court hallway. Kid, you're a lucky son of a bitch, Irv said after presenting our case to the judge and DA at the trial hearing. They're dropping the charges to a misdemeanor. You just have to plead guilty to marijuana and pay a fine. I was relieved and happy as hell. The only problem was there was about 30 camcorder tapes in the back of the range, including footage of Killer Black, the Scarface Twin, Yammy, remodeling our house in Freeport, classic studio sessions, sex tapes of groupies, all sorts of rare priceless memories. I need my tapes from the back of the truck, I said. Listen, kid. Irv said sternly. Whatever's in that truck, forget about it. Walk away. It hurt my heart that I lost all that footage. I gave E Moneybags $2,500 for a B he produced for the Murder Music soundtrack, which he put toward the Silver Navigator. Soundtrack Studios was becoming too expensive, so I made a deal with our engineer Steve Sola and the owner of a cheaper studio in Long Island called Music Palace. I started spending the night at Music Palace because I was working too late to drive upstate to Pomona every night. Green Eyes, Mike DeLorean, E Moneybags, and his homeboy Majesty would swing through. I bounced over to Queensbridge the following day for the YBE video shoot with BG from Cash Money. The owner of New York Furs, Irvin, lent me 15 of his best fur coats, chinchillas, minks, and mink hoodies. He looked out for me with the furs because I paid him to make 10 Buttersoft, infamous records leather jackets with leather bandanas to match with some of the money Ron Artest invested into the company. Although I didn't request it, Loud Records hired a jeweler to come to the set with a bunch of jewelry for me to wear, even though I had my own. Baby, Juvenile, BG, and a bunch of their boys showed up while a video director, Little X, was setting up shots. BG pulled me to the side and asked if I could get my hands on some diesel, which is heroin. So I sent drawers to buy two bundles of dope. BG took the bundles straight to the bathroom. It was the first time a New York rapper did a song and video with cash money. A rumor went around that I was robbed outside the video shoot for $300,000 worth of jewels the jewelry that Loud Records had rented for the shoot. The story even made the newspapers. I won't elaborate for legal reasons, but can you believe that the jury company thought that I had something to do with the situation? I wonder what would make them think that. <laughs> a week after the video shoot, Green Eyes had a birthday party at a sports bar 
on the corner of Liberty Avenue next to the Van Wick Expressway in Jamaica, Queens. I bumped into Bags. He told me that he had drama with some dudes who might show up at the party. He pulled a mini 45 caliber out of his pocket. I'm going to lay a nigga down tonight if I see one of them, he said. I had my 9 milli on me, so if it was going to be something, then somebody would definitely get laid down and out. The day after Green Eye's birthday party, I contacted a hot producer named Seven to get beats for Balls and Hooks and myself. Seven had well-known hits with Ja Rule and Ashanti. He told me to meet him at the Crack House, a studio owned by Irv Gotti and Ja Rule. When I arrived, I saw Irv Gotti and a couple of his Murder, Inc. artists, Cadillac Ty and Black Child. I knew Irv Gotti from seeing him at industry functions, but we were never cool. But I knew his R&B singer, Ashanti, and her mother, Tina, very well from my grandmother's dance school. When Ashanti was 16 or 17, her mother gave me a copy of Ashanti's demo and wanted me to sign her. She sounded amazing but I wasn't mentally ready to do the label thing. A couple of years later, Irv Gotti and Ja Rule signed her and blew her up. Irv brought me into the studio, where Seven played me some beats. I got a call from E-Money Bags, so I went into the hallway to talk to him. When I told Bags that I was at Irv's studio, he said, Tell that nigga Irv that E-Money Bags said what up, he know me. I told Irv, and his face instantly changed like he was nervous all of a sudden. What's that about, I wondered. I made a copy of one of Seven's beats and bounced back to the Music Palace studio to meet Balls and Hooks, Green Eyes, and Steve Solar. Late that night, Green Eyes said he needed to talk. He complimented me on infamous records and told me to stop hanging out with bags. He didn't tell me why or by who. He just said to stay away because bags was about to be hit. Bags was hype about getting his navigator. Come with me to the dealership in Long Island, he said at the studio one afternoon, just after Green Eyes told me to stop hanging with him. They're giving out good deals for luxury cars. We hopped on the Long Island Expressway and headed to Champion Motors. On the way, Bags broke down the whole story about the connection between Irv Gotti, Ja Rule, and Supreme. Bags told me Irv was a neighborhood DJ at park jams and block parties back in the day. And Irv and Ja were just two studio gangsters. Irv Gotti and Ja Rule? They were the herbs in the hood. And now Supreme's got them under his wing, Bags said. Before I gave Bags money for the song he did for my Murder Music soundtrack, he was planning to buy a tag car from this girl named Z, who went to my grandmother's dance school and sold tag cars for Supreme. Capone from QB, with a white buggy out bench from her a few months prior. Baz gave Z a thousand dollars for a down payment, but when he got the twenty five hundred from me, he decided he wanted his money back to get a legit car, a navigator instead. You got to take that up with Prane, Z told him, because he told me not to give you anything back. Supreme brushed Bags off like he was a punk. Bags was a member of a Jamaica Queens gang in the late 80s called the Young Guns that had a big brawl with another gang from Jamaica, the Lost Boys, at Sunrise Multiplex. Somebody was shot in the eye and killed inside the theater. Bags was the shooter. He's the reason why that movie theater has metal detectors to this day. Bags told me he was coming out of the Coliseum on Jamaica Avenue one day and saw Prem parked in a Land Rover with a dude named Black Just another well-known member of the Supreme team, in the rover's passenger seat. Bags proceeded to shoot up the rover with bullets, learning later that he missed Prem and shot Black Just in the upper inner thigh. Instead of driving Just to the hospital, Prem drove him 10 minutes away to the hood and told somebody else to take him 10 minutes back so the D's wouldn't question him. Black Just bled to death, but if Prem would have dropped him off, at Marion Macklin Hospital right around the block from the shooting, just might have lived. 50 Cent felt the same way about Irv and Ja, Bag said, and he didn't get along with Prem either. So when 50 first came on the rap scene with songs dissing Irv and Ja, 
Supreme put a hit on 50. And that's why 50 got shot up. Bags knew that Preem put a hit on him, too, for killing Black Just. But he said he was going to kill Preem first. Now I understand what Green Eyes was telling me and why Irv Gotti looked like he seen a ghost when I told him I was on the phone with Bags and why Ja Rule was acting tough on that Limp Biscuit tour. I was thinking as Bags spoke. He figured he had Preem to protect him. E-Money Bags went on to tell me how he was connected with Tupac. Bag's homeboy Majesty and Majesty's brother Big Stretch were blood cousins with Young Noble from Tupac's group The Outlaws. So they all hung out on a regular basis in the early 90s. Tupac was so tight with Big Stretch that he'd given him appearances in two of his movies, Above the Rim and Bullet. While he was in New York shooting Above the Rim, Tupac had also befriended some dudes from Brooklyn, Jamaican Jackson and Johnny Lynchman, as well as a few other Brooklynites like Biggie Smalls, Little Sean, and the whole Bad Boy clip. Bags explained that shortly after the filming of Above the Rim was complete, Tupac, Jamaican Jackson, and some others went to hang out at a nightclub where they found groupies to bring back to Pac's hotel. One of the females called the cops, claiming that Tupac and his friends raped her and the judge sentenced him to a year and a half in prison. During the trial, the press questioned Tupac outside the courthouse about his co-defendants, Jamaican Jackson and others. I don't know them dudes. They not my friends, Tupac said. Jamaican Jackson and his friends didn't like that very much. While Tupac was out on bail, he set up a recording session at Quad Recording Studios in Manhattan with rapper Lil Sean. Stretch, went with Pac to Quad that night and noticed a man leaning against a street pole reading a newspaper right in front of the studio door as they arrived. Stretch told Bags that when he and Pac walked inside, the man followed them into the lobby, gun drawn, along with two other gunmen. They went straight for Pac's jury. Pac had two Glocks tucked in his pants and tried pulling them out, but shot himself in the groin. The gunman opened fire on Pac, raising him on the head and a few other spots before running off. Stretch told Bags that he and Pac went up in the studio with Biggie, Puff, and Lil' Sean saw Pac bleeding and were all in shock. Bags then told me that they found out who shot Pac in the lobby that night. Bags and Stretch visited Pac on Rikers Island a lot, and they told Pac who ordered the hit and who took it, so Pac knew exactly what was going on. He knew that Biggie and Puff had nothing to do with it. But when E-Money Bags and Stretch explained what happened, Pac told him that he planned to use the situation to sell a lot of records. Bags explained who was behind it, but Pac said he just wanted to start controversy, and he planned to use Biggie and Puff and turn his gunshot wounds into a marketing and promotion scheme. Wow. As Bags finished the Pac saga, we pulled into the dealership. Bags ordered a silver navigator with gray leather interior, TV, and a Sony PlayStation. In his navigator the next day, Bags passed me his pager and told me to look at the message. It was from Ja Rule's label mate, Cadillac Ty. They're over here right now. Come get them. Cadillac was referring to Ja and Irv. You see that, right? Bags turned to me and said, They old man lined them up for me. We just robbed them niggas for their chains. The year 2000 zoomed by. I turned around and it was 2001. I was in Harlem rolling down 125th Street on my way to the Triborough Bridge when I slowed down to get a good look at a brand new 2002 Yukon Denali XL. I'm buying one of those immediately, I said to myself. Two months later, I bought an all-white Denali XL with gray leather seats. My man Gotti from QB and I was sitting in the truck when a new Jay-Z song called Takeover came on the radio. The beat was hot, so we turned it up and heard Jay-Z dissing Nas and me. I was wondering what was taking Bitch Boy so long. I thought, let the games begin. The radio station Hot 97 was promoting its annual Summer Jam concert at Nassau Coliseum. Mob Deep wasn't performing, so we paid it no mind. The June day of Summer Jam, Havoc was in the basement in Freeport 
making beats while the rest of the crew was in the living room playing 007 on PlayStation in two-player mode. I got a phone call from Ella G, who was at Summer Jam with a bunch of his friends from Brooklyn. Yo, P, this bitch-ass nigga just tried to play you during his show. G said. What you mean? I asked. Jay-Z, I told you that picture was going to come back to haunt you one day. G said. Jay had the picture of you when you was a kid dressed like Michael Jackson up on the screen. I started laughing. It sounded funny as hell. I had to admit, <laughs> that was a good joke. In the song, Takeover, Jay had a line about me. You was a ballerina. I got the pictures. I seen you. Drop shook ones, then you change your demeanor. We don't believe you. You need more people. But anybody who went to my grandmother's dance school has seen a picture of me when I was eight years old dressed like Michael Jackson. Jay-Z couldn't confront the issue that started our whole drama, so he diverted the people's attention with a joke. The debate was about Jay not being active in the rap beef with Snoop and Tupac and how he waited years until Tupac and Biggie were murdered to start running his lips about New York been soft ever since Snoop came through and crushed the buildings. I'm trying to restore the feelings. That's the reality that Jay has to deal with when we all get tired of laughing at me in 1982 eight years old, dressed like Mike. But I did like the tactic that Jay used. It was pretty slick. Nas dropped a song called Build and Destroy a few months later, and in the lyrics, he took shots at me all of a sudden. Prodigy used to be my man, do all the robberies. At the end of the song, he said something about how he was still cool with me and that I just needed to stop hanging around certain people, those people being... Called Mega and Bars and Hooks. Nas went from playing me close in the studio next door to asking me to be on his QB project to intercepting my artist from Queensbridge because he didn't know who the new talent was to calling my crib after 10 years to playing a part in my movie to Prodigy used to be my man. What? Was this fool schizo? People in Queensbridge told me that Nas made that song because he was mad at me for doing a song with Cole Mega, in which Mega took shots at Nas in his verse. Mega didn't like Nas, ever since Nas booted him out of the firm and had started dissing Nas for a living. But I didn't diss him. Mega did. Why you not confronting Mega? I wondered of Nas. You scared? Why didn't you fight DeLorean when he choked you up in the studio? You scared? I asked a Braveheart for my chain back. Bullshit, I ain't asked for nothing. I went and got mine's back by myself when some of my boys from QB told me not to. Why would Nas diss me in that song? I didn't realize the answer until months later. Nas was being just as tactical as Jay-Z. After Summer Jam, I started going bonkers on Jay-Z with diss songs, and Nas was actually jealous because my beef with Jay-Z was getting a lot of publicity. On a Friday night the following winter, Jay-Z went on Funkmaster Flex's Hot 97 radio show, freestyling with his new recruits, Beanie Siegel, Young Guns, and Freeway. Balls and Hooks, Green Eyes, E-Money Bags, Majesty and I were at the Music Palace studio. Jay's boys sounded real good, until I heard Beanie take an indirect shot at Mob Deep. Something about, I creep on your quiet storm. To top it off, Jay had some nigga named H Moneybags rhyming with them. E Moneybags started spazzing. I had a private number to the radio station, and after about 80 rings, somebody picked up. Yo, this is Prodigy, I said. Let me speak to Jay Z. Jay just got on the elevator and left. You just missed him. The person on the phone said. Go catch him and tell him Prodigy on the phone. Okay, I'm going to try. Hold on. Five minutes later, Jay got on the phone. What's up? Jay said. Yeah, what up, nigga? I said. Hold on, somebody want to talk to you. Bags was asking for the phone, so I handed it over. Yo, what's up? Just eat money, Bags. How you got some dude up there using my name? You know me, nigga. Who the fuck is H Moneybags? So, what are you trying to say? 
Jay asked. What am I trying to say? You know what the fuck time it is with me, nigga. Don't try to act like you don't know how I rock. Bags said. Bags went to high school with Jay, and they know each other very well. This is what you called me for? Jay replied. Oh, now you acting tough. Bags said. You tough now? You know I'm going to see you now, right? Say no more then, Jay said. Say no more? All right, so when I see you, you know what it is. Say no more, Jay said. The following Friday, I called Flex and asked if E-Money Bags, Nori, myself, and Nas could come to the station later that night and do a freestyle session just like Jay and his team did. We wanted revenge. Flex agreed. Bags called Nas so he can come with us, and Nas said he would. While we were on our way to the station, we called Flex, and he put us live on the air. As we crossed the 59th Street Bridge, Nas emailed Bags, backing out. Yo, I ain't coming. Just go up there and tell everybody who the real king of New York is. Bags read the message to me while I was driving. Maybe Nas was scared we were going to do something to him because he had just dissed me on his song. But we weren't. The real king of New York. Nori met us in front of the station, and we linked with Flex in the lobby. Thanks for coming up, but my boss just called and told me to cancel the show, Flex said. I can't let y'all up, because they think it's going to cause some beef. No matter what we said, Flex kept saying that he can't do it or he'd get in trouble. Outside, a Lincoln Town car pulled up and five dudes with plastic cups of Hennessy in their hand hopped out, screaming, Hey, yo, what's up? I grabbed my hammer on my waist. Yo, we from Far Rockaway. We heard you on the radio saying y'all were coming to the station, so we came to hold you down. I told them that Flex wouldn't let us on the air. Fuck them Rockefeller faggots. We came up here to wait outside and creep on anybody trying to creep on y'all. We from Far Rockaway, P. Far Rock got your back. Soon after the disappointment at Hot 97, the co-owners of The Source, Dave Mays and Ray Benzino, told me that the new Source Awards were about to take place in California. Look, you know this clown Jay-Z is running around front like shit is sweet, I told Benzino. If y'all want us to perform at the award show, then I need you to hook us up with 30 passes and seats for my boys. I promise we won't hurt Jay inside the venue or ruin your show. I just want to show this clown and everybody else what kind of power Mall Deep has. Please do this for me. Benzino paused for a moment, then said okay. The whole 12th Street crew got on a plane to Los Angeles. Havoc, Twin, Nitty, Godfather, Gotti, Free High, Little Lord, YG, Kiko, Derek from the Bronx, Mike DeLorean, Mr. Bars, Green Eyes, Larry the Movie Director, Fly, Prince Guard, me, and like 14 others. It was the first time on a plane for a lot of them. We stayed at a hotel across the street from the House of Blues on Sunset Boulevard. While we were stopped at a red light on our way back to the hotel from dinner, I looked over at a payphone on the sidewalk to my right and couldn't believe my eyes. It was our homeboy Draws from Queensbridge. What the hell was Draws doing in California on a random payphone? I rolled down the van window and yelled, Draws, get your ass in the van. Yo, Thud, I came out here with Thun and them dudes left me stranded. Draws, who only spoke Thun language, explained, Thud, this is crazy, I bumped into y'all like this. He was saying that he came to Cali with Nas and Nas had left him. Draws was wow. The nerves in his hand were damaged from being shot so his palms were always sweaty, and he carried a washcloth everywhere. Back at the hotel, Draws told me how he was calling his man Rain at the payphone. You need to meet my thun Rain, Draws said. Thun got crazy connects in the music industry. I can't even get us some guns out here. Thun got a lot of ties in L.A. When he said guns, that sparked my interest. After about an hour... Draws told me his man 40 Glock was outside the hotel and Rain had arranged for him to bring us the hammers. In front of the hotel on Sunset Strip, a dude with cornrows introduced himself. 
What up, cuz? I'm 40 Glock. He's my little homies, he said, motioning to his boys. 40 was cool. I could tell he was a crip because of how he spoke and he and his homies had on blue. 40 Glock and his people met us at the Shrine Auditorium for the Source Awards the following day. We all had on custom-made football jerseys with Hennessy, E&J, Seagram's, Thug Passion, Bacardi, and other liquor names embroidered on the front and our names on the back so our crew would stand out in the crowd. Little Kim flew out to perform the Quiet Storm remix with us and brought the whole Junior Mafia crew. Our dressing room was connected to Lil' Kim's, so my crew drank and smoked with them until taking our seats two rows from the front of the stage at showtime. Tupac's group, the Outlaws, was seated directly in front of us. It was our first time seeing each other since the beef, and because so many of my boys were there, I didn't want to make the Outlaws feel uncomfortable, so I made small talk with them to let them know it was all good now. The famous polo model Tyson Beckford was also seated in front of us, and he pulled out a gallon of Hennessy from under his seat, then showed it to Havoc and me. We told him to pass us the bottle back and thugged out the whole gallon. I didn't drink that hardcore shit anymore, but I had to take care of my boys. When the Houston rapper Scarface, seated in the road to our left, saw my team drinking, he was like, What's up, man? as if he wanted a cup. So we poured him one. By the time I gave Tyson Beckford back his bottle, it was mostly gone. Mob Deep was the final act of the night. Smoke filled the stage with the thunder from the Quiet Storm intro, while Havoc slowly drove a caddy truck on stage and hopped out when his verse began. The crowd erupted. I hopped out along with Noid, who was holding a gown of Seagram's gin, jumping around as it spilled all over. After Havoc's verse, Noid opened the back door of the truck and assisted the Queen Bee Little Kim out while she spit her verse. Hey yo, prodigy, tell him what it is, Dunn, Kim concluded. As I screamed, yo, it's the real. Our boys in the crowd were wailing like we were inside the tunnel back in NYC and the shrine went nuts. After my verse, a gang of death row bloods came storming through the entrance and charging down the aisles from both sides. They ran to the stage while we were chanting the last few words of our chorus, chasing Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. Snoop, who was with his crew, the Eastsiders, ran out the back exit while his boy, Trey D, stayed and fought a handful of death row dudes whipping their asses all by himself. The Shrine Auditorium turned into pandemonium with small fights breaking out in the crowd. Heading back to the hotel room on sunset, I thought... I wonder if Lil' Kim and them are okay. So I called Kim, and she said that I should come hang out at a hotel later. Twin, DeLorean, Mr. Bars, Free High, Draws, Gotti and I hopped into a van to the Swiss Hotel by the Beverly Center Mall, where Kim and her friends were drinking frozen apple martinis in a penthouse suite. In her room with D-Rock, Gutter, C's, Banger, and other junior mafia members, plus five of Kim's female friends. Her hotel room was crowded, so Free High got one of her girlfriend's numbers and then we left. On our way out of the lobby downstairs, Kim's hairstylist ran out of the elevator calling my name. P, Kim wants you to come back upstairs. I told my boys to bounce and send the van back to pick me up later. Back inside Kim's room, I noticed that Junior Mafia was gone, and it was just Kim and her girlfriends, plus the hairstylist. Kim poured me another apple martini, and we stepped onto the balcony to talk privately. I grabbed Kim by the waist and started kissing on her neck. I thought about Mary J. Blige and decided to play this situation differently. Stop, not right now, Kim said. There are too many people up here. I understood what she meant, but I kept trying to sex her right there on the balcony. After five minutes of us failing on each other, I fell back because it was obvious she wasn't trying to let me hit right then and there. But the thing she told me 
let me know for sure that I can get with her at some other time. Kiki always thought Kim and I were sexing, but it never happened. When Kiki first heard the Quiet Storm remix featuring Lil' Kim, out of jealousy, she told me, that song is whack. After an HNIC promo tour throughout the tri-state area and down the East Coast in October 2001, I took a bunch of my boys to Puffy's restaurant, Justin's, on 21st Street in Manhattan, down the block from Soundtrack Studios. Drinking champagne while checking out the scene, the rapper Queen Pin spotted me and asked me to dance. More the type to lurk in the cut, watching my surroundings, I wasn't big on dancing. But for Queen Pen, I made an exception. While we were grinding on each other, she started sucking and tongue kissing my ear. I was a bit shocked. We had done a song together a year or two earlier, but it was strictly professional. After she molested my ear, the DJ made an announcement. Big shout out to Jay-Z and Jermaine Dupri up in the spot. I see y'all. I walked over to my people. Where's Jay-Z? I asked, surveying the shadows of Justin's. I don't see him. So we lined the front door of Justin's on both sides. We weren't going to let Jay-Z leave without dealing with us first. Yo, P, we going to beat the lips off Jay's face as soon as we see him. Godfather Nitty and Nitty's cousin Kiko all assured me. Kiko had a gun on him and wanted to shoot Jay. No, it's not that serious, I said. You just gonna beat him up. Gonna pull that gun out. Through the crowd, I saw Jay and Jermaine walking with three bodyguards towards us. Jermaine Dupree was aware of my beef with Jay and visibly shook. Started speed walking with his bodyguards when he saw me. He quickly hightailed it out the door. Jay-Z spotted us lined up at the door waiting for him. Then from about two yards away, he extended his hand to shake mine. It ain't no beef, Jay said. It's just music, man, no drama. Oh, yeah? I said, shaking his hand. I just wish you would have spoken to me before you said those things about me in the sauce, he said. But it ain't no beef, all right? Yeah, okay, cool, I said, and let him walk out the club. Keep in mind that I let him walk out. Queenpin is my witness. I could have changed Jay's future that night, but I chose not to. Jay put the white flag up, and his cop-out made me instantly realize that he wasn't no threat. He's just a big stuffed animal, a camel to be exact. I got serious beef for real gangsters. Jay's just a waste of my time. A few days later, I heard that Mike DeLorean and his boys from QB had broken in the half crib and stole his sampler keyboard, PlayStation, and even a framed portrait of Havoc hanging in the living room that Hav later found under the porch. Then, they walked around Queensbridge asking people if they wanted to buy half stuff. How stupid can you be? A week after the break-in, I saw DeLorean sitting in a brand new black excursion. I traded in the bands you gave me for this, he told me. I asked him if it was an even trade. No, he said. I still owe 15000 The blue bands with the TV inside and 20-inch rims that I gave him as a signing advance was totally paid for. Then I looked at his neck, and I saw that the infamous records chain I got him with Ron Artest's invest money was missing. I sold the chain because I had to put the money down to get the truck, he said. So you sold the chain and the bands to get a truck? That you can't afford? And you robbed half credit? I said. What's wrong with you, man? You just fucked everything up for us. I severed my ties with balls and hooks. How stupid could you be? At the end of 2001, I received my certified gold album plaque for HNIC. Havoc only produced two songs on the HNIC. Not because... Only wanted two beats. I was forced to find other producers because Havoc wasn't showing any excitement or enthusiasm about my solo project. I wish Hav would have done the whole album. 
Shortly after I got my gold plaque, Bags went to go check Havoc in Freeport. After the break-in, Hav's uncle, Lamik, gave Havoc two pit bulls, Black and Blaze. They ran loose in the yard and barked at all who passed by, especially mailmen and delivery people. We walked up to the gate surrounding the house, and the dogs went bananas, acting as if they wanted to kill Bags. They looked crazy. Hate and fury filled their faces, barking like never before. Bags couldn't even come inside the gate because I couldn't control them. And when Havoc came out, he couldn't either. Hav had never met Bags before, so he came to my truck and made small talk. We were in the area, so I just wanted to introduce them. Bags and I drove back to Queens, parked in front of Majesty's crib in Hollis, we sat in Bag's Navigator and played PlayStation for a while. I'm going to come get you early in the morning so we can start working on that mix CD together, I said. Cool, he said. Call me when you get up. I hopped out the Navi and into my truck and went home early for a change. The next morning, I called Bags around 11 to see if he was up and ready. Somebody else picked up his phone. E? I asked, confused. No, this isn't E. Who's this? It's P. Let me talk to Bags. This is Detective... Can't remember. You'll hear about what happened to E soon. I hung up quick. Oh, shit. Did they kill Bags like Green Eye said? I wondered. Nah. Maybe he got locked up or something. I couldn't reach Majesty on his phone, so I went to his crib later that evening. Majesty and a few others were sitting on the steps in front of his door with a big bottle of Hennessy and plastic cups. Madge explained that his family was having a cookout earlier that day in his backyard. Bags had parked his new Navigator next to the house, as usual, and they took a smoke break in the Navi because they didn't want to burn the weed in front of the kids in the yard. Madge ran back to the house to get a plate of food before it was all gone. And while he was filling up his plate, Four masked gunmen ran up to the Navi from behind and opened fire. Bag's truck and body were riddled with bullets. Stray bullets went flying through Majesty's house and almost hit the little kids in the yard. Bags died with his gun in his hand. He must have seen them coming, but it was too late. I didn't want to cry, but it was hard not to. I couldn't control it. P, I want to show you something. Majesty said. He went into the house and came back with an 80-page spiral notebook and handed it to me. What's this? I asked. It's one of Tupac's notebooks, he said. He left it here when he used to hang out with my brother. You need to read that. I opened it and saw Pac's notes and poems, plans, scribble scrabble, and chicken scratch. It was amazing to have Tupac's notebook in my hands. I wanted you to see this because you need to know how similar y'all niggas is, Maz said, pointing out pages outlining Pac's plan to unite OGs, community leaders, rappers, and street hustlers from every hood across America to help create more positive and peaceful communities. He had it all mapped out. Reading his notebook gave me a newfound respect for Tupac. I knew about Pac's Black Panther and activist upbringing, but now I got a glimpse of the real him. Tupac envisioned similar plans for everything that I used to talk to E-Money Bags and Majesty about, but his plan was more precise and made more sense. When I was done reading, I was at a loss for words. Looking at Madge, I felt pain for him. He lost his brother Stretch, who was murdered in Hollis in the late 90s right after Tupac was killed. Somebody shot up his MPV minivan and stretched crashed into a tree. And now he lost his best friend, Bags. On the way home, I thought about how Hav's dogs went crazy when they saw Bags the day before. Could it be they sent something? Maybe E had an eerie energy that the dogs could feel. R.I.P., my nigga. After Bags got killed, I was upset but had to stay focused. 
I had a beautiful woman and kids, money, cars, jewelry, fashion, fame, power. And since I wasn't abusing drugs and alcohol, I had my health. I felt unstoppable. I finally learned how to defeat my sickle cell pain and was living proof that sickle cell could be controlled with a proper diet and healthy lifestyle. It took a lot of discipline and self-control, but I was now living pain-free. It felt like a natural high. Anybody who'd experienced the destructive lifestyle I had been living and then made that 360 change would know exactly what I mean. I called Queen Pin and asked her to play a part in my murder music movie. During the scene when she got out of a Range Rover and pistol whipped a dude for selling drugs on her block, Queen Pin stepped onto the curb the wrong way in her heels and broke her ankle. In show business, there's a saying, break a leg. Queen Pin must have taken that shit seriously. Just kidding, QP. The foul part was, we didn't even use those scenes that she broke her ankle filming. Half of the movie was complete when my director, Larry, pulled some bullshit. Our verbal agreement was that I would play a small part in his film statistic, and in return, he would help direct and film murder music for 5% of the profit. My lawyer drafted a contract for Larry to sign, and we met in Manhattan to look the agreement over. Larry took the contract to his lawyer to check out and suddenly stopped picking up my phone calls for several weeks, which turned into months, after I had already spent $300,000 of my own money on the project. I deserve more money and credit than this, Larry insisted when he finally got back to me. He said if he didn't get what he wanted, he wouldn't finish filming, and he had all the film that we shot. It turned into a big legal battle. I felt like kicking myself in the ass, not to mention Larry's. The movie was delayed for a year, and I was so furious with Larry, and more so with myself, that I became self-destructive. 300000 of my own money, and this dude was refusing to finish filming and withholding my film reels until I agreed to his terms or at least came close. I asked Had for a cigarette. That was the beginning of my downward spiral into the old poisonous lifestyle that took me so long to shake. At around 1 a.m., I went to my bedroom, turned my stereo to Quiet Storm radio show on WBLS, old school R&B slow jams, and turned off the lights. The only light in my room was the dim glow from the stereo system equalizer and tuner. As I laid relaxing to the old school sounds, I saw a black shadow-like figure walk across my room. It looked like the black Spider-Man. No face, no features. Ghost-like. All black. Scared, I pulled the sheets over my head and forced myself to sleep. When I couldn't control the way the film was going, I lost my mind. It seemed like that shadow was all the negativity that I had flushed out my mind, body, and soul, just waiting for an opportunity to jump back inside of me. And it did. The next morning, I woke up with sickle cell pain. That one cigarette turned into packs, and that occasional drink turned into bottles of Hennessy and more weed than the western town. The evil, nasty, disrespectful bastard was officially back in full swing. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. Infamy. 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 I'm a young rich ass nigga who love to show you how a nigga get his lights. Blue teach you the mystery of God and murk you. Pray for me. After recording a bunch of new music, Havoc and I got loud records to open a new budget for our next album in March 2002. Kiki came up with the title. Relaxing at home in Rockland, she was flipping through the dictionary and told me, y'all should name y'all next album Infamy. I knew it was the perfect name, and when I told Havoc, he agreed. Full of drinking, 
and cigarette and weed smoking that I started doing again, I hid from Kiki. She had cleaned her body of all that poison along with me. And I didn't want her to start back up just because I had. Plus, I was embarrassed. I wanted her to be proud of me. If she found out, she'd have been disgusted. But my sickle cell pain started to surface every now and then, so she probably knew something wasn't right. Having made this beat in the crib one day, it reminded me of Quiet Storm because of the house music style drum pattern. Havy didn't like it that much, but luckily, I was there before he had a chance to erase it. This is another quiet storm, son, I said. The drums are similar. Yeah, I know, but it ain't all that, he said. Give me an hour with a right to the beat, and I'll bet you change your mind, I said. One hour later, we had Hey Love, Anything. Although the beat reminded me of Quiet Storm, his guitar riff sampled over the drums and bass line reminded me of Romance and a Woman while her man was close by, so I had to whisper in her ear on the down low. When Hav heard my verse, he followed suit and wrote a similar verse minus the talking in her ear thing. Now all we needed was an R&B chorus. We decided to try and get Puffy's group 112. Ran a rough version by Chris Lighty, and he agreed to get them for us. 112 listened to our lyrics and came up with the perfect chorus. We were done with the bulk of the album there. Played it for Steve Rifkin, and he set up a photo shoot for the album artwork, plus a video shoot for the 112 single. A few days later, we came up with a new song that was more hood, with an up-tempo beat that sounded like some Beach Boys surfer hip-hop. We put Noid on it and called it Burn. Havoc had the idea to feature the female rapper Vita on the chorus. Vita had just signed to Irv Gotti and Ja Rule's label, Murder Inc. So I was surprised she agreed. It was so hot, we stopped the presses on Hey Love and put out Burn first. We wanted to satisfy our core audience, and Hey Love had a crossover radio sound. Loud agreed. Hey Love targeted a female audience, even though the lyrics were still hood, especially my verse, because I'm talking about robbing a dude's woman. If that ain't grimy, then what is? This was our first album since that Jay-Z prodigy beef, so people were waiting to see how we, especially I, would retaliate. They heard me dissing Jay on mix CDs at the Summer Jam, but this was the new infamous Mob Deep album, so people wanted to see what was gonna happen. Jay-Z told me, it ain't no beef, it's just music. So I gave Jay some just music to listen to on Burn. Just pain, just suffering, and worse than that, you let me get my hands on you and I'm taking advantage, and that shit that you pull ain't do me no damage. You don't know me, nigga, but we about to change that shit. We leaked the song to Funkmaster Flex, who played it on Hot 97, and the DJs across the country started doing the same. Mob Deep was back once again. A lot of people thought Jay-Z ruined Ma and Mob Deep's career, but there's no evidence of that. We were still in our own position of power, as was Jay. Jay just made it look better because he had so much money from Rockefeller Records and he was selling more albums than us. But we weren't selling any less than our past albums. Jay must have been pissed that radio was playing out this record because Vita backed out of the video shoot. Well, when Vita had come to the studio to record her part on the song, I had kicked it with her and got her phone number. So I called her and asked her what happened. Pete, you know I love y'all and I want to do the video, Vita said. But Jay called Irv and told him not to let me do the video. Irv said I couldn't do it. I'm mad as hell because it would have been good exposure. It's all good, love, I told Vita. Too bad, though. Wow. Wow. What was Jay so worried about that he had to tell Irv Gotti? 
Don't let her do that video. Oh well. A thought struck me after I got off the phone with Vita. Oh shit, that's how he got it. I said to myself. When Vita told me that Jay-Z called Irv Gotti like a little girl, it hit me that Ashanti must have showed Irv my grandmother's concert program book with my Michael Jackson picture in it. Irv must have had given it to Jay-Z. Irv Gotti probably didn't even like me because of E-Money bags and didn't let Vita do our video. <laughs> Two bird-ass bitch boys. Jay-Z and Irv Gotti. I laughed thinking about them plying with that picture like they had some information to destroy me or something. Scott Storch produced the last three songs for our album. Scott was a ghost producer for Dr. Dre, meaning Scott made the beats, but Dre took the credit, Scott told me in the studio. When a big-time producer like Dre takes a young and up-and-coming producer under his wing, the big-time producer lets the young one learn a lot of his tricks and helps the young one get his beats out there. The young producer usually gets little to no production credit. But after a while, he may become as big as his mentor. Scott Storch became a new hot shit on the scene when people discovered he'd been making most of Dre's bangers. We were the first to grab Scott, buy tracks, and give him full credit. On Infamy, he produced I Won't Fall plus Kill or Be Killed, featuring Ron Osley from the Osley Brothers. I wrote the bridge for Ron Osley to sing. Let me tell you, Ron Osley was a player for real. He came to the studio with two fly young ladies who were singers. Ron and the ladies sang the bridge together. I was open. I wrote R&B lyrics for Ron Osley. At the very last minute, Havoc got in touch with R&B singer Little Mo, and they made a song called Pray For Me. When they played it for me, Havoc did this new style of rapping where he was cutting words in half like infamous and murder, pausing between syllables. It was unique. Nobody had ever rapped like that before. Hav left the first 16 bars open for me, and I copied his flow. The album was done. We received some bad news right before we handed in the finished product. Steve Rifkin sold loud records to Sony for about $80 million. And Sony dropped most of the loud artists, keeping only the most profitable. Luckily, we were one of those profitable groups. So now, we were forced to be on Sony Records. Steve had hinted that he was going to do this when h and came out. He said, I'm about to start getting into Southern rap music. I'm not signing a New York artist anymore. Steve didn't give us any warning about the sale of the label to Sony, though. He basically used us as a bargaining chip because he knew that if we found out about it, we would have fought to get off aloud. And without Mob Deep, Steve would have gotten less money from the sale. Sony's not a bad company. It's a major record label while Loud was just independent. We were only upset because Sony's a huge company and we were used to being the center of attention at Loud. At Sony, we were little goldfish in the ocean of sharks. We played it smooth though and let our album get its numbers. But we were quietly scheming to get off of Sony. For the time being, we had to make sure Infamy did well. And it was doing just that. Burn created so much hype that we started to get calls for tour dates. We toured overseas, and it always amazes me how much they love Mob Deep. Alchemist became our official tour DJ and an honorary Mob Deep member. On tour, we turned that boy Alchemist out, a.k.a. the Red White Vulture or Red Bird. He learned how to be a vulture real quick. Because on the road, we move with that old New York Minute mentality with food, alcohol, females, whatever. Move fast or get left out. Alchemist caught on fast. 
The new album dropped while we were on our tour. We shot the Hey Love featuring 112 video in Atlanta. Little X was the director. The video production team wanted me to pick my love interest from a pile of models pictures. But I told them I was going to use my baby's mother, Kiki, instead. And why not? She looked just as good as any video model, if not better. And she'd get paid for it. Kiki was open and flew to Atlanta with me. We were kissing in a video, and when it came out, people were saying, Oh, shit. Pete turned to a sucker for love. He kissing some chick in his new video. Nah. Sorry. That's my woman for real. People were saying, Mom Deep is soft now. They doing radio love songs. But Hey Love is far from soft. It got more radio spins than Quiet Storm and gave us a gang of new female fans. We loved it. The ladies would be lined up in the front row and I'd find the best looking one and spit my verse looking her straight in her eyes. So despite Jay-Z and his fans' attempt to make us look as if we lost the battle with them, Infamy sold over 800,000 copies, proving that our power and position hadn't changed. I must admit, my lyrics had become a little lazy and sloppy. I was messing up spiritually and health-wise, back on drugs and alcohol. My decision-making was terrible, and it was evident in my music. My mind, body, and soul were clouded and polluted. People who paid close attention to my lyrics were saying, You're slipping. You're not rapping the same. And I thought they were crazy. I was arrogant, acting as if whatever I wrote to the beat was hot. I was feeling myself, or playing myself, rather. But I couldn't see it at that time. Even though I put my all into making good songs, my negative behavior was showing up in the form of lyrics that didn't grab people as tightly as they once did. My grip was slipping. After getting our gold plaque for infamy, we did a concert at Nassau Coliseum in Long Island. Several other acts were performing that night. Backstage was packed. Walking to the stage, somebody next to me said, Yo, P, what up? When I turned to look, it was 50 Cent. I didn't really know 50, but it was good to see him healthy. It took him a while to recover from those nine gunshot wounds in 2000. I gave him a handshake and got on stage to perform. 50 stood on the side of the stage watching, or should I say scheming, because nobody knew yet that he was about to take the music industry by sheer force. A week after the concert, Havoc and I met L. Londell McMillan, a young black entertainment attorney from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, who had his own firm and several big celebrity clients, including Prince, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, and Spike Lee. He was the lawyer who got rappers The Locks and R&B group Total off of Bad Boy Records, so we figured he was the perfect person to get us off of Sony. It took a few months of negotiation, but finally, after eight years of being slaves to record companies, we were finally free. Infamy was damn near platinum, and we were free. That's unheard of in this business. You don't let an artist out of a contract whose album is on the verge of going platinum. It gave us power to do whatever we wanted. Lundell promoted artist empowerment and he and I became close. I want to get a distribution deal and stay independent now that we're free, I told him at his office, seeking his thoughts on how Mob Deep should proceed. He agreed 100%. You guys are in an incredible position right now. All you need is a distribution deal, Londell said, offering to assist us in securing the right deal. You're going to get five times the amount of money. I was all for it. Havoc found a fully equipped studio for sale right off the Van Wick Expressway in Jamaica, Queens and decided to sell the Freeport house, move into a condo in New Rochelle 
and make the new studio our official headquarters. Before selling the infamous mini mansion, our friend, a police officer from the neighborhood, threw a pajama party at his house and invited us. I didn't like the idea of being cool with the cop, but the guy was a big Mob Deep fan. He gave us a bunch of plastic PBA cards that saved you from catching tickets. Havoc, Gotti, Papa Mob, Free High, Noid, Fly, and I wore boxes, white tees, and Timberlands to the party. There were ladies with barely anything on all over the house. As we were getting ready to leave the party a few hours later, Free High was standing next to me in the living room. I love you, Pete, he exclaimed out of nowhere, biting my neck. Yo, the fuck is you doing, yo? I screamed while his drunken ass laughed. Bugging the fuck out. Fuck is wrong with you, man? I was ready to punch him, but Papa Ma calmed me down. Freeha started acting real strange. Papa Ma and I were watching TV in Freeport when Freeha stopped by, going on and on about his new girlfriend, Lil' Kim's homegirl, whom he met in Lil' Kim's hotel room after the Source Awards. He told me how he pistol whipped some dude who he caught the girl cheating on him with. Havoc told me that he heard that Free High killed the dude and shot the girl, too. It was hard to believe. Then, when we were out of town for a show, this old-timer approached me while I was walking to a store by the hotel. Are you Prodigy from Mob Deep? The old-timer asked. Yeah, what's up? You know this nigga named Free High? Yeah, that's my nigga, I said. What's up? Yeah, the old timer said. That nigga killed my niece. I'm looking for him. Oh, shit. What? Damn. I ain't seen him in a long time, I said. But I had just been with Free High two weeks before. I had no idea what to think. A month or two later, Free High was arrested for making a direct sale to an undercover cop in Queensbridge. At his trial... At the courthouse on Queens Boulevard, the judge sentenced Free High to five years. He had just come home three years earlier after beating the cab driver murder rap. Free High laughed, grabbed the court officer's gun, and shot at the judge. They tackled him to the floor, and the judge hit that fool with all kinds of time. The crew was all at the Freeport crib the morning Free High shot at the judge, watching the story on the New York One news channel. What an idiot. We all agreed. Free House probably never coming home now. Havoc finally sold our house and moved into a new spot in Westchester County. Our new studio in Queens was official. On a nice quiet block. We hung up all our gold and platinum plaques on the control room and Mike Booth walls. Our friend Fly learned how to work the Pro Tools and became our engineer. A lot of hits were about to be made. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. Free agents. 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 Sitting back plotting on ways. How we can get this money. We need us a payday. Dig in my pocket is nothing but change. I dig deeper, but still coming up with change so we Called the lawyers to fix this shit. He said, it's all right. We about to be free agents. Have patience. We can't, though. We need paper. Paid in full. Settled into our new studio and freed from being slaves to any record company, we felt refreshed and had a boost of musical energy like never before. We celebrated by recording a mixed CD called Free Agents to let the entire music industry know we were free to make a new deal. I didn't want to do another regular record deal and become slaves to somebody else's company after we fought so hard to become free. With the regular deal, we'd only be profiting 90 cents per album sold. With the distribution deal, our profits would be more like 4 or $5 per album. But Havoc didn't agree. If we go independent, then we won't sell as many albums as we would on a major, he said. His logic was that 
we would have to do all the promotion, radio, and marketing work ourselves. I don't want to focus on business. I just want to make music, he said. Some people aren't built for wearing both hats. I told Havoc we were a team, and I was capable of being creative as well as handling our business. So I would make sure Mob Deep was straight on both sides, but he didn't agree and we argued. My passion was to own and operate my own business. I observed how the older artists did it. Wu-Tang, Puff, Jay-Z, Master P, Cash Money. Chris Letty would try to discourage us, saying, Everybody thinks they could do it like Cash Money Records now. It's not that easy. But it was that easy. My grandmother raised me to own and operate, so I was built for it like a brick mansion. I was angry that Half didn't want to take advantage of this stellar opportunity and started to realize the true downside of having a partner. We had to agree or the partnership would collapse. Londell tried to talk sense into Havoc, but it didn't work. Look, why don't we just keep Mob Deep on a major label and put our solo albums out independently, Havoc said. People are used to seeing our product pushed by a major machine. If we do it ourselves now, it's going to make us look small and ruin our reputation. Havoc had a point, and I decided to go with his plan. The songs we recorded for free agents were some of our best, and they ate me up inside that we were going to let somebody else live lavishly over our hard work and talent. But for the love of Mob Deep and Havoc, I kept my mouth shut. It took two months to complete free agents. 50 Cent was going hard to get back into the game and get signed again, releasing a bunch of mix CDs, including Guess Who's Back, through Bob Perry at Landspeed. We set up a meeting with Bob Perry, who ran Landspeed, a small but successful label. Havoc called 50 to record some songs with us before our meeting with Bob. Havoc, Noid, and 50 did a song called Bump That that I used for the Murder Music Movie soundtrack. Havoc and 50 did another song called Pop Those Things that I had a verse on. We put it on the side because it was so hot we wanted to save it. We explained our plan for the project to Bob. We wanted a healthy six figures up front for free agents. Didn't want our faces on the album cover or any advertisement for the project. No radio, videos, or interviews. We just wanted the industry to know we were free. Bob agreed to the terms, and we put it in contracts and signed a deal to get 50% of all the profits. Right before free agents dropped, Kiki and I were at the supermarket when I got a call from Violated Management Office. I have 50 Cent on the phone for you, Chris Lighty's assistant said. 50 got on the line. What up, Pete? He said. I heard y'all doing a deal with Bob Perry at Land Speed. I'm calling to let you know that I don't think you should do the deal. Because if Bob fucks up the project, it's going to make Mob Deep look bad. You guys are in a great position right now to do something big. I fully agree with 50 and wanted to tell him how I really felt about being independent. But Havoc and I had already come to a compromise. I couldn't explain it all to 50 because that would show a sign of weakness as if Mob Deep didn't have our business and partnership in order. Yeah, we already did the deal, I told him. It's all good. It's just a mix CD to let the industry know we're taking meetings for a new deal. The way we structured the deal with Bob, we can't lose. That was my first real conversation with 50. Chris Lighty was managing him. He had a tremendous buzz, and he'd been going hard at Ja Rule, Murder, Inc., and Supreme. 50 was just as cool as E-Money Bags told me. Hearing the fire in his voice on his mix CDs, I could tell he was about to blow up huge. A couple of weeks later, Free Agents was released and sold 400,000 copies, quicker than expected. Calls started coming in from Universal, Warner Brothers, Jive, and others. A few years earlier, Dr. Dre had signed this new white rapper named Eminem, who become the biggest selling artist in the game. He made an autobiographical film called 8 Mile 
and used two songs from Infamous in the movie, Shook Ones and Survival of the Fittest. We didn't know he was going to be rapping to our beats in the actual film, and we were happy as hell when we found out. Eminem showed Mob Deep extra love in his movie, and we loved him for it. Eminem's manager, Paul Rosenberg, started managing Alchemist. I asked Alchemist to pass the word to Paul that we were interested in doing a deal with Eminem's Shady Records. Al said he'd try. Havoc and I took a meeting with Warner Brothers. They offered us a 50-50 profit split deal. Warner Brothers had just signed his new female R&B singer named DeMello, and the A&R asked if we would do a feature on her first single, Best Love Story. Soon after we shot that video, we found out that Eminem had just signed 50 Cent to his Shady Records. 50 put out his first major hit, Wankster. The world was in a 50 Cent frenzy. Our next meeting was with Universal Records president Kedar Massenberg, who happened to be the nephew of Dr. York, whose books I've been reading for years. He offered the same 50-50 profit split deal. Chris Lighty had become the head of Job's urban music division, so we met with Job president Barry Weiss, who was interested in giving us the same 50-50 split. Havoc and I discussed the pros and cons of each offer and decided to go with Jive, since our manager Chris would be handling our project. After about a month of negotiations, we inked the contract and had a small signing party at the office with the whole Jive staff. In the Jive Mob Deep signing photo, I'm the only one not smiling. All that was going through my mind was, we just signed away our power and our grandkids' power once again. We went to work on a new album. I came up with the title, America's Nightmare, because we were rebellious and against the grain, and corporate America fears that. Londell McMillan helped me to complete the deal with my murder music movie director, Larry. I cut Larry a small check and kept all the rights. Then we shot the last few scenes and began the long, tedious process of editing. I handpicked every cut, like putting a puzzle together. I edited all day and recorded songs at night. After three weeks, we had a rough version of the film with a score by Alchemist. I know you're upset with me, but you're going to thank me because I taught you a lot about the movie business, Larry said. If you think the music industry is foul, the film industry is way worse. These people are sharks. <laughs>